This is amazing. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, hello, everybody. I, I, I'm sure there's still a few people connecting. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, this is gigantic. This is very cool. Uh, so I think we're going to keep everybody muted. So uh, please try to keep your mic muted. Um, and uh, Steve will probably, our, our moderator, Steve Hullfish, will probably uh, elaborate a little bit more. But uh, if you have questions or comments or anything, uh, pop them in the chat and uh, Steve will try to get around to it. Um, but uh, we want to welcome everybody. Uh, it's amazing to see you all here. Um, a little bit about this. Uh, we really just wanted to reach out to, I mean, everyone, but uh, specifically, uh, we were looking to reach out to young uh, black men and women who are interested in uh, storytelling through filmmaking. And um, the kind of the genesis of, of how this came about was uh, a conversation that uh, Simon Smith and I were having um, about representation in the film industry and, and in editing in particular. Um, and I'll just say, I, I don't think outside of the industry, uh, a lot of people know what we do as editors. And, you know, honestly, even inside the industry, I'm not sure a lot of people know. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I was coming up, uh, I, I didn't even know myself. I didn't know until I was kind of deep into it. And in my experience, uh, mentoring uh, young black kids who are interested in filmmaking, I, I found that a lot of times uh, they, you know, they had no idea what editing was. Uh, but once we started the process of, you know, shooting and editing, they would find a real passion for it. And, and a lot of kids are, are really wonderful storytellers and, and wonderful editors. But uh, I think, unfortunately, a lot of black kids don't get some of those opportunities uh, on the way to be exposed to, you know, the software and the hardware and the tools. Uh, but they also just don't see other black editors. They look at our industry and see, you know, a lot of white faces, and it is. And um, so we really want to give an opportunity to, uh, you know, young black kids in, in particular, but, but really anybody to kind of learn about what we do and, you know, some of our approaches to it and how you could get involved in the industry too. Um, and part of the reason that, uh, and I'll try to be as brief about this as I can, but part of the reason that Simon and I were having this conversation uh, was that a, a, a couple weeks before there had been uh, a Facebook group uh, for editors. It was probably like 13,000 members, something like that. And uh, there was a, a black editor who uh, made a post in the group asking to connect with other black union editors. And the response from some of the white editors in the group was uh, immediately to be offended by it and to uh, just react in a really upsetting way. And I actually, just, just so you know, in case you didn't see it, I actually printed out some of the comments. I'm just gonna read one of them so you get the gist of what happened. But, uh, you know, one of the commentators who was a white editor, uh, who, and who was a white editor who has worked with a lot of, uh, a lot of big name companies, and uh, like companies like Nike on campaigns for black athletes, he says, uh, in response to this thing that's just asking for other black union editors, he says, white people, it's time to speak up vehemently against the anti-white racism so proudly displayed here and in the culture before it's too late. This is about the country you and your kids will live in. I mean, this is, this is just a response to a, to a simple request to connect with other black editors. And I think uh, of, of the uh, black editors on this panel, uh, I think we've all experienced stuff like that before. Uh, and, you know, some of it, some of it might be racism, but some of it comes from, I think, a fear of uh, this kind of unknown quantity uh, that that black editors might get jobs of white editors for like the first time in film history ever, right? And um, it's, it kind of speaks to this deeper thing that I think we experience that uh, 
we really have to be uh, kind of screened and, 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 and more qualified and, and all these things. Um, and this was a conversation that Simon and I were having because uh, my wife, Nicole, who is right next to me, come in. I just want to bring her in real quick. Uh, <laughs> all right, she didn't want to be on that long. Um, she had uh, made a uh, response on Twitter, basically calling out uh, the, the specific people, but also kind of the attitudes uh, that I think are really pervasive. And um, it, it really blew up and it, and it caused a, a ton of conversation that I think was really important. And I, I praise you for that. I think that was excellent. And um, some of those, among those conversations, uh, you know, uh, Simon and I had a conversation about uh, the issue of representation and kind of what I was just talking about a little earlier about, you know, I think it's a multi-headed monster and, and part of the problem is an is a industry problem uh, and is a networking problem. And I think another part of the problem, and there's, there's all kinds of things, but I think another part of the problem is that uh, there's just not a great influx of young black editors the way there should be and the way that, I, that, that we all think there could be. And so, uh, you know, hopefully with this panel, by the end of it, uh, you guys all have a sense of what we do and some of our approaches and a sense of how you could get involved too. Uh, and so, uh, the, you know, I'm awed by the people on this panel. So, uh, and, I'm, and I'm awed by the amount of people in this chat. This is uh, really awesome. I don't, I don't know uh, if we had planned on it getting so big, but uh, this is really phenomenal to f see all your faces. So Steve, please take my mic away from me. I don't want to take a mic away from you. Not with that kind of talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Hi, hi everybody. My name is Steve Hullfish. If you don't know who I am, uh, I write a, a blog and do a podcast called Art of the Cut. Um, I've edited a, a, a bunch of movies. I worked for Oprah for 10 years here in Chicago. And um, I just wanted to be a part of this. Uh, I was part of that discussion that uh, I actually saw your wife's Twitter. That was the first time that I'd heard of it was that her her tweet and I saw that and and uh, offered up Art of the Cut to anyone that wanted to have some kind of a voice that felt like they didn't have a voice. Um, a woman named Felicia Livingston took me up on that and since then hopefully we'll have uh, more uh, people of color on the podcast. It's not something I ever um, didn't want to have. It's just most of the, I pick great projects like Kelly's been on my, uh, my uh, blog because she it's Breaking Bad and who doesn't want to hear about Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Um, th what I want to do to start out this is to let everyone who's watching know a little bit about each person. So I've told you a little bit about me. I'm going to go, nobody else is going to have this probably same order, but I'm going to go around in order of the people that I see on the screen and ask them to give a quick bio. And then what we want to do is talk about editing. And why this is a great profession. I think everyone here will say that it's a great profession. Um, so many people, you want to be a director. You know, maybe that's what you want to do in this business. And the, one of the things what, that I love about editing is you get so much quality time with a director when you are the editor. Nobody else on the crew. Everybody thinks, hey, I want to be the cameraman. or I want to be on the set with the actors. The, the editor gets the FaceTime with the producers, with the executives, with the director. They're the ones, you have a job for a year when many of your colleagues who are on the crew might only have a job for a month. You know, a typical shooting schedule for a feature film is maybe 60 days, uh, 45 days, and then you edit for a year, you know, many times. So it's a much more stable profession uh, you're sitting in a nice cool room with air conditioning. This is a great profession. You get to really be a storyteller. You get to really be a filmmaker. And so I highly recommend this as a profession. And I'm sure you're going to hear the same thing from everybody. Simon, could you quickly introduce yourself and tell people who you are and uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. Thanks, Steve. Um, my name's Simon Smith. Uh, I was the editor on the series Chernobyl uh, last year. Um, I've also just edited a series called... Um, 
the third day, which will be on HBO uh, later this year. Um, look, uh, I, I'm from England. I, I work in, in the UK, in, in London and so on. And we're doing a terrible job of, of representation and diversity and including people in, in England. Like I can name six, you know, black editors and that's it. That's, that's the six that, and, and I, you know, I'm in those corridors. I see people and there's something wrong with that. I mean, I, I, I really feel that um, for me, this is a bit of a, a recruitment drive. You know, we need you all to, to come and, and join our industry. We need your voices. Um, we value your, your, your creativity and your input. Um, and like everyone is saying it, like, we, we have the, the, the BAFTAs and the BFE over here and they're all saying we, you know, we need to be doing this. We want to be doing this. Uh, so we need to like, you know, start putting, putting words into action and, and, and trying to actively find ways of, of, you know, getting people in and, and encouraging that. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great time for inclusion. Felicia Livingston, when I interviewed her, said this is a great time to get into the industry. There's so much need for content. I mean, right now it's coronavirus and productions are kind of shut down, but more and more people are needed in this industry. And this is the time, a great time to get in. Braden, can you um, continue to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am, uh, I'm Braden French. I'm, uh, I'm mostly edit documentary. I do a little bit of scripted. Uh, you know, when I started my career, I did a lot of unscripted. Um, I, I, most recently I did a uh, dark girls two for, uh, Oprah Winfrey network. And, um, I did surviving R Kelly a, a couple years ago and, uh, kind of other various docs and shows. And, uh, I, you know, as I said before, this is something I'm really passionate about and I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, me and Nicole, my wife here, are just really awed by uh, how many people are in here. This is amazing. But yeah, there you go. That's great. Kelly, tell me, uh, tell us a little bit of who you are and what you, what you caught. Uh, hi, my name is Kelly Dixon, and um, I'm currently working for Marvel right now, but um, I was doing uh, Breaking Bad for a good, I think, six years, and I did three seasons of Better Call Saul, and uh, within that time, I was also doing The Walking Dead for a season and a couple of pilots for a season, and I left Better Call Saul and did uh, the feature film The Goldfinch in 2018, um, and I think, you know, what I'd like to say, you know, because I'm like, look, I'm not really sure. I don't want to be presumptuous and say what everybody, you know, is here for, but in listening to um, you, Steve and Simon, um, and again, Brady, I don't know you, but I would love to know you at some point, lunch. <laughs> um, um, but um, I mean, I'm really appreciative of being asked to do this, but I get the feeling that a lot of these people probably really do want to be, in, it's not like we have to like, you know, say, please come join our industry. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be presumptuous. Maybe that's not the truth. But it seems like a lot of the questions that I always get are, how can I do this? How can I get in? Um, and I, you know, it, that's a much longer discussion. But the one thing that I will say is that, yeah, usually I'm the only person of color or one of the very few. Maybe there's a PA or something because, oh, we got to hire some a person of color, right? But, um, but I think also what I really try and do, what I've really noticed is that, you know, I think that there's a small um, percentage of producers, writers, directors who really um, are like trying to specifically find a person of color. But I think most times they just hire who they know. You know, they hire who they know, or they hire friends of who they know. It's so, it's like, you know, they'll, they'll or, you know, they'll be like, oh, just like you said, let me find somebody black, right? And, you know, I'm not going to try and call you out, but Terry, you're one of my heroes. And it's like, 
for a while, and I know this is not true, but Terry was the only black editor, right? I mean, you know, and it's like, but you know, look at all these people. And so people will go and they'll hire, they'll hire who they know, or they'll hire who are friends of who they know. And the problem that I really find in the industry is that most of the white establishment just doesn't know that many people. And so they want to hire people that they're comfortable with, right? Look, I only got where I got because I started out as an assistant editor. I've worked for white people. I've worked for people of color. But I actually was working for a really great editor, a white woman, who got hired on Breaking Bad. And it turned out that I was, you know, just in that position where I was ready to move up. And, you know, and so I spent a lot of my time, you know, aside from doing my job, talking to Vince Gilligan, talking to him about stuff, not like the X-Files and just talking to him about, about other things. So by the time it came to where, you know, they might hire me, they were already, it was like, we know you, you know, they were already comfortable. Um, and, and so I guess in all of that, what I've been trying to do in like events that I go to, mixers, stuff like that, is to introduce more and more people into the social circle. So it's like, it's not like you're trying to say, hey, I know a black assistant. It's like, hey, have you met my friend? She works on blah, blah, blah with so-and-so who works on that. And usually within the six degrees of separation, you increase the social circle. And that's how I've been trying to sort of make this difference. Because look, I, you know, nowadays with, I'm sorry to go on, but nowadays with all of the, you know, the television jobs, especially, most of the assistant editors are working for the post producers, right? You know, the, the sort of dynamic has changed a little bit. I can hire one person, but post producers hire a lot of people and then they know a lot of people. So the circle of influence gets bigger. So I think that, um, I think that I, I want to say the, the way that I'm trying to increase the visibility is to increase the circle of it, the circles of influence and the social circles, because the more people know, you know, like Simon, I don't know you, I've never met you, but it's like now I can say, Hey, I know an assistant or there's like 96 other, you know, editors and assistants on here. You know what I mean? And that way, you know, the, uh, you know, it's not that they're looking for, oh, we need to like check off a box. Cause I, I mean, look, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I got us, I'm assuming that a lot of us have felt like, oh, they got, they're checking off the box. Right. You know? And, um, and so I'm trying to like make it so that more people know more people. So it's not that you're hiring diversity, you're hiring a friend, or I met you at that event, or you work for so and so that I already know. And so that's my that's my uh, that's my piece. Daisha. Um, I'm Daisha Broadway, and I started off working in reality TV. I actually worked with Braden for like five or six years, I think. Um, and I most recently. Uh, Cut Insecure and a Black Lady Sketch Show um, and Twenties and Boomerang. Um, all of that was in like one year. It's like a wild 2019. It's crazy. Um, and I'm working on a feature right now. I've been trying to also just advance my career in, in a way that like I can work on things that I'm proud of. Um, but I definitely have been the only one especially when I was working at Brave, I was definitely the only black female editor I ever saw at the company we worked at. Um, and I was there for seven years and I was just like waiting for them to like figure it out. But I also didn't know any other black female editors at the time. So I think um, no, you know, no stranger to being the only one in the room. But also I think if I was younger and I knew that there was an amazing black woman cutting Eve's Bayou and loving basketball, that would have been really helpful for me when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do um, professionally. So I'm really excited that this panel is happening. Um, I think there's some girls in here from Sierra Leone. I want 
want to give them a shout out, like students from Sierra Leone, like I think that's super cool. I think that seeing us um, do this is like super helpful because like I said, I mean, I've definitely been mistaken for the PA most of my career. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's like, a, you know, I feel like a lot of, a lot of the white males that um, I've worked with definitely walk down the hall like this. Whereas I feel like the rest of us kind of walk down the hall constantly looking at everyone and everything. But, you know, if you thought I was the PA, you might ask me, hey, are you the PA? Because I'm looking for this versus, you know, coming at me and starting barking orders because you just assumed who I was. And I think that that's just because of a lack of seeing who I am in the office. So um, I think it's really important to, uh, to get this going, especially now that everyone's suddenly paying attention to it. I would like to definitely make the most of it. So I'm, I'm really happy that this is this is happening today. Kristen? Um, hi, I'm Kristen. Um, I started off, I think my story is probably very, very different than a lot of people's. Um, I didn't really go to, I didn't go to school for filmmaking. I went to school for math. I com come from a completely different type of um, situation. I ended up taking just like a random summer course at USC one summer, it was like six weeks long. And um, I became obsessed with Abbott and had a really good teacher who told me I should change careers. Um, I was working for the government at the time. And uh, so I did, um, I was selected for a program at ABC Studios in post-production and they take people who don't have a background in filmmaking and they expose you to a department of your choosing for a year. Um, so uh, I was selected for that and I chose post-production and I learned the ins and outs of post-production for a year um, from the corporate side. At the end of that program, they told me you can decide if you wanna stay corporate or if you wanna still be freelance. And I told them I wanted to be freelance and I've been freelance ever since I started out being a PA for a few ABC studio shows. Uh, then I broke out um, and did an indie feature um, as an AE. And then I went into reality. I've done a little bit of every type of genre there is to do. And yeah, I've been assisting for the last about four years. Paul? Hi, uh, Paul Alderman. Um, like Chris and I kind of came a different way. I didn't go to film school or anything. Um, I, I spent my, my early 20s and everything in the military. And uh, I just fell in with a whole bunch of military cats, you know, between different missions. All military guys do is sit around and talk about movies. Um, and I was like, man, I, I got a love for this. And it's, you know, some other things I did when I was younger. Um, and I was like, well, I'm gonna pursue it. So got out the military. Um, really push it hard and, you know, uh, just keeping it short. I got here in LA about 2007 and just, I went to a film or yeah, kind of a avid program called uh, Video Symphony. They're no longer, but uh, I used to be in Burbank. Um, and I just hit it hard. I treated it like a second job as far as uh, getting better and training. Um, and then once I finished there, I've worked uh, pretty much everything from commercials, television, features, and uh, you know, one of my best experiences was working at a photo camp, being in the post house. Um, I got to learn post from a side that I always feel uh, assistance. Uh, a lot of people in the editorial don't get to see. Like a lot of people don't get to see those faces that are going to tell us any or understand, you know, why tapes are laid out the way they are with a particular burn-ins um, and. I just got introduced to a lot of other software too that you only see at big post houses. Um, so it just allowed me to kind of come up with a, just unique solutions to a lot of things. Um, and that's what keeps me working. And uh, here I am. Harry? Hi, um, I'm Terry Shropshire and I am an editor. And uh, I want to thank every single person who's taking their Sunday, uh, it's gorgeous here in California, to spend some time uh, with us. And uh, I just, I'm going to back it up a little bit. I literally imminently just finished a film that's on uh, Netflix right now called The Old Guard. 
And uh, before that, I was working on a limited series uh, called When They See Us. And uh, before that, it was I worked on a film with Catherine Hardwick called Mispala. Um, other projects I've worked on is Eve's Bayou and Love and Basketball and Talk to Me and Caveman's Valentine and um, Secret Life of Bees. I've been very, very fortunate to, um, you know, I've been doing this for a minute. And in fact, I've been doing it longer than some of you. I lo I'm looking at some of these faces and I just know you were not born when I started. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> which is a little like scary, but um, I, I came up, uh, wow. You know, I, I literally, I did go to, when I went to college, I went in as a journalism major and then uh, promptly applied to the film department, got accepted, kept both majors because they both had certain aspects that um, really helped me ultimately to get to where I am. Um, when I first got out of college, I wasn't editing the minute I got out. I did a lot of jobs. I was a PA, a production coordinator, production secretary. Um, I didn't jump right into editing. Um, but at a certain point I did. Um, and even when I wasn't at, you know, jumping into editing professionally, I was editing friends gigs on the side and I was still doing, you know, ultimately working as an editor, even though I wasn't being paid to work as an editor. But at a certain point, I just, um, I focused strictly on editing. And once I did that, I kind of, again, had to start this back in the day when there was film and I worked my way through the cutting room. I worked my way through the craft apprentice, second assistant, assistant, uh, first assistant, you know, uh, I, I, I worked my way through editing rooms and I worked, I was fortunate enough to work with people who saw the editing room as a teaching um, environment and, and encouraged me to cut whenever I could and, and watch and observe whenever I could which is much, much harder right now um, in our digital world, but it's still possible. Um, and I am here today because there were people who um, gave me opportunity, who allowed me to cultivate my talent and, um, you know, gave me access. Um, and, uh, and when I got that access, I was ready, I was prepared, I delivered, and then I moved on to the next and I delivered again. And, uh, and so I'm very, very fortunate, but I also worked really hard to um, take whatever opportunities cross my path and, and make the absolute most of them, which is something that is really important um, to do is to be prepared um, for you know, whatever you, you are wanting to pursue. I'm sure there are people in this, this room that are aspiring um, to get in the chair or are different stages of getting in the chair or already in the chair. I've certainly had people in my editing space who don't necessarily know what they want to do yet, but sometimes you have to figure out what you don't want to do. Um, so I'm hoping I'm here to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about and um, hopefully feel this, understand that there is a community of us out there. And it's certainly a lot different than when I was coming up. I still remember the first time I saw a black person in the cutting room and I was at Paramount Studios and um, I literally was working on a project as an, assist, uh, an additional assistant coming in. And usually when you're working in that kind of environment, you, you know, you're always walking down the halls, moving, you know, again, that's when there was film and you were moving back and forth to the cutting rooms and, you know, taking film in, taking film out. I remember walking down the hall and literally, you know, when you're an assistant, you kind of keep your peripheral vision, like who else is in the other rooms? You know, you're kind of checking out who else is there. And I literally did one of those things where I walked and in the peripheral vision, there was somebody that was, you know, brown and, and cutting. And I literally did a moonwalk kind of back word <laughs> and, and it was um george bowers and it it was like that was my first unicorn so to speak in terms of you know seeing somebody that 
and unfortunately George is not with us anymore. And the first edit, you know, the first black editor I worked with as board assistant was Earl Watson, who's not around anymore. Um, and the first black woman that I saw cutting was Lillian Benson, who thankfully is thriving. And so, um, but to be in this kind of space and see all of these faces um, is, is gold. It's, it's amazing. So I'm going to stop talking so that we can get into the conversation. But thank you so much for asking me to participate, Simon. And I recognize a lot of people here and, and I, and um, very exciting. Um, I want to get to some questions from the group uh, pretty quickly, but I do want to start the conversation first by asking, because everybody gets, has a different way into the industry. And I want people to realize that there is not just one way in. And so many people think, you know, I got in in a strange way. That's how, certainly how I feel. And um, Kristen kind of mentioned that that's how she feels. I think a lot of us got in in a little bit odd way. I want each person to quickly give us an, uh, how, did, how did you get in? How did you make that first break into the industry? And then I want um, Simon, I, I want uh, Sushila Love. She says, unfortunately, even those of us who have joined the industry have been um, have a lot of roadblocks. And I want Shilla to talk about roadblocks after we have this quick discussion. Um, so if you could unmute her at the end of this conversation, there's a woman named Sushila Love. Um, so uh, Simon, how did you get into the industry? Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, so, you know, exactly as Kelly described earlier, I, I've tracked every job that I've had and they've all been who you know, right? It's always been um, someone that I've known is doing the job and, and I've got a break as a, as a second assistant on, on their gig. And um, that's, for me now, having realized that, having realized that my success is so much from who you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, well, surely we need to now be reaching outside our networks of who we know and trying to get CVs in from people that we don't know, you know, because that's, that should be compulsory in the UK, the, the channels, the channel four and so on, they have a, a remit where they have to publicly advertise jobs and, you know, stuff like that could, could really help solve this, this actual problem and roadblock of, of who, you know, you know, if, if jobs were posted more, openly on on either through the unions or through through other networking groups um in realizing that we've got a problem unfortunately i've, I've realized steve that that my own experience of how i've got to where i am is is uh, um you know tied in to that problem right it's it's always been about who i've who i've known yeah, and I, I thought about that when Kelly was talking, I think it was Kelly talking about um, the fact that the more of the people, not just on the panel, but the more of the people who are watching this get into the industry, the more likely it is that there will be someone you know that's a person of color. So every success that all of you who are listening achieve, the, that will help because then it's more people that, that you know. Um, for me, I, I understand that there's union um, uh, lists and that kind of thing. I meet a lot of people through editing uh, like social events. Like uh, in Chicago, we have a Chicago editors um, group. It's run by an African-American woman named Sue Lawson. Um, I go there and if I met a young black editor or someone that aspired to be a young black editor, I would definitely, that would be a chance to get a job. Um, you know, do I want to work with you? Do you seem bright and like somebody I want to spend 12 hours a day in a room with? That's the big thing. I think a lot of people think about, you know, oh, I don't have the skills. For me personally, hiring somebody uh, to be an assistant editor, and, and I would love to hear Kelly and some of the other people talk about this. It's not, I don't really care whether, you know, how much you know. I, I don't probably want to teach you the way I want it done instead of how you've learned to do it. Um, you just need to meet someone. And those are a lot of social, social networking. It's a lot of going to events where you think, oh, Kelly's at this event or Braden's at this event. If you can get to those events, then it's a possibility to meet those people. Um, Braden, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the industry? Yeah. Um, I 
when I initially came out to LA, I came from Wisconsin, um, where I where I'd gone to uh, film school, and uh, when I initially came, I had no idea what I wanted to do in terms of uh, how I wanted to be involved in the industry. I just knew I wanted to be a part of the filmmaking industry. So I was working, uh, I think, three internships at the same time. I was uh, PAing on every single set I could get onto. And kind of the way I got in um, was that I was a, a PA on a like a like a Disney commercial. It was like a two day shoot. And um, my first AD, I, I think he was the only brother in the in the in the whole crew. And so I, I just kind of went over and I talked to him a little bit and we engaged a bit. And uh, his name was Austin Daverin. And he ended up telling me about uh, his uh, some shorts he wanted to shoot. And I was I, I just kind of flashed back in that moment to how much I loved editing in school um, and how much I kind of still loved it uh, when I got the chance to do it. And uh, so I told him, I would love to uh, cut your shorts. You don't have to pay me anything. You don't even have to like it. Uh, just just give me a shot at it. And he agreed to it. So I, I um, you know, cut one short for him and it turned out really well. And then we just kind of kept going with this relationship. And what ended up happening is he uh, kind of moved on to, uh, you know, he would first AD with uh, bigger name directors and stuff. And he actually linked me with uh, Bill Duke, who uh, had me do uh, a, some sizzle reels for him. And then that kind of blossomed into a relationship on its own. Uh, and I ended up doing Dark Girls with Bill Duke and Chan Berry. And uh, at the same time, I was working uh, as a logger uh, for an unscripted company. And so I was just uh, very involved with Post. But I think the way that I got in really was uh, being really aggressive in my networking and uh, almost shamelessly promoting myself uh, as an editor and taking any job I could get and just going full steam at it. And I, you know, I think it really speaks to um, what Kelly said, uh, which is another thing that uh, I've spoken about and I believe is, and Simon and, and Steve, I think we all know this is a network industry and almost every job you get uh, or, or the majority of jobs you get come from a networking experience. They come from a recommendation or they come from you know, a, a post soup or a post producer who has either worked with you before or got a recommendation from you before. And I think what happens uh, for black editors is, I mean, it's totally true. Uh, there's usually not more than one or two uh, on any given production, even if, even if uh, you know, I've been on edit staffs of you know, 20, 20 or more people and I've been the only black editor or there might only be one other one. And that, you know, that doesn't strike anybody as weird because that's kind of the default. But, you know, if you get three or four black editors, people are going to start being like, this is, this is kind of weird. And, and that's, it's, it's a problem, uh, you know, that's really industry wide, but I, I think uh, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's something that we can battle by bringing up, people with us. Uh, and I, I think that's probably one of the most important elements because when people are given recommendations, if you're working on an edit staff of 20 and you only know one other black editor, you know, maybe you bring them into that meeting, maybe you give them the recommendation, but it, it's just the numbers aren't there. And, uh, but, you know, long story short, I got in through really aggressive networking and, uh, you know, being at it all the time. Yeah, uh, I. Well, there were probably more than I would say. The Oprah staff was about half and half, which is you know obviously outstanding, but um, un very unusual, of course. Um, uh, Kelly, tell us a little bit about how you got into your position, or at least got into the industry. How did you break in? What was your first job? Oh, Sorry, I worked in the mailroom. Uh, 
that's how I, I hate to admit it, but that's how old I am. Um, yeah, I worked in the mailroom. I, I really wanted to be in in advertising. I wanted to write ad copy. I, I was a journalism major too. And I thought that only the only people that were in the film industry were people whose parents were in the film industry. And, you know, anybody that went to film school, it was like, I was like, you know, what a waste of money, <laughs> you know, because it's like, you're not going to get in unless your dad's in it or your uncle or something. Um, so, I mean, that isn't the truth now, but, you know, when I was in school, it just didn't seem like it was really uh, very logical to try. Um, and I, I just kind of got in the, I, I didn't, I couldn't get a job in an ad agency. So a friend of mine, no, my cousin, actually, my cousin knew a friend who was working as the head of the mailroom at MGM. And so then at that time, I, I really wanted to be a production assistant. I mean, I didn't know. I, I, as a journalism major, I did some editing at, at school and I was good at it, but I didn't know that any of those jobs were like, you know, really available to me, not because I couldn't do them and not because I didn't know people, but just because, you know, you only get them is if your dad is doing it or your uncle is doing it. Um, so I really wanted to get to be a production assistant because I could like, you know, uh, move around to all the departments and, you know, ride a bicycle around the lot. That, that was kind of my idea when I was younger. And then um, once I once I got there, then uh, my first job was on 30 something. Um, it was back in the late 80s. And uh, I started really understanding what the different departments did. And that's when I started hanging out in editorial. And, you know, the one thing, I don't want to take too much time because I've been trying to answer a couple of these questions on the text. Well, I'm not that, not that I'm like ignoring all of y'all, but I'm, I'm like going, God, maybe I can answer that one real quick. Or maybe I can answer that one real quick. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's um, I was going to mention that one of the things you said in the beginning was, you know, and I tell assistants this all the time, you know, this being an assistant editor, especially is the only place that you are going to spend hours, weeks, months with above the line people. Nobody else in the crew gets to do that. You know, as an assistant editor or even as a production assistant, I was like hanging out in editorial all the time. And, you know, I still have some of those relationships today. So it's like, you know, because what happens is when the editor's trying to work, a lot of my job was keeping the director occupied. Back then, I was playing like Nintendo Game Boy Golf with a director while my editor was busy trying to make changes, um, you know, stuff like that. And, and so, you know, I tell assistants all the time, first of all, I tell them, look, you know what, I know that you're really busy because nowadays assistants have a lot more to do than I used, than we used to because, you know, I mean, there was a time, I'm sure some of the, Terry, I know you can, you can, you can account for this. There was a time when assistant editors didn't even have their own avids. They had to share. They had to wait until the editor was done to do their work. Right now, they have their own avids because they have so much work to do. But back then, it's like they didn't. And so, you know, I would tell assistants, look, I know you guys have a lot to do, but it, you know, if you have an hour a day, especially when the director's there, when the producer's there, and the director and producer are cool with it, I want you to be in my room. I, you know, you can be either taking notes, listening, but it's like, that's the only time that assistants are going to have the time to be around these people. More if they can, but I know they have work to do. But the thing is, is that I always, in, in my rooms, I always like assistants to be around because most of the time, if I need the assistant to go do a visual effect right quick, and the director has a rapport with them already, then they'll say, hey, while you're doing this, can I go work with so-and-so on that? Yeah, go do that. Yeah, you know, and so now what they do, and, and especially in television, this helps a lot because producers a lot of times may not know the assistant's name because they're always that guy in that other room doing we don't know what, right? But if they have a rapport, it's like, hey, you know what, if my assistant goes and listens to music along with this scene while I'm taking care of this, 
then they get to know that person. They get to know them. They get to know their name. They get to know, they, you know, you'll talk about what movies did you see? Hey, did you like the new Star Wars? Hey, you know, all that stuff. They have a rapport with them. Then guess what? One day I have to go to the dentist and they're like, well, can so-and-so take care of that? Yeah, yeah, let them do that. Then all of a sudden, guess what? There's a job. Do you see what I mean? It's like, and, and the other thing that I'll mention is I was listening to a panel um, a couple of days ago out of, the, out of Canada and they were interviewing Jeffrey Ford. Now, I mean, I don't know if y'all know Jeffrey Ford, but Jeffrey Ford is like the Marvel, you know, top, top guy. He's the, he's the maverick of Marvel, right? He, you know, and one of the things that he said that I've, I've been saying a lot too to people is like, look, you know, um, oh, fuck, what did he say? Shit, no, I, I don't want to misquote him, shit. Um, um, ah, fuck, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Um, but anyway, you know, it's like, that's the thing. You Oh, I know what he said, and I've been saying it too, is that you, uh, he wants assistants who want his job. And I remember listening to that because I was like, look, I really like assistants who want my job, but I don't want an assistant who's going to throw me under the bus to get it, right? But I really want that because what happens is, and that's no, nothing against assistants who just want to be assistants because there are those two. But what I like about assistants who want to be editors, they start to think like editors, which means they start to prepare my stuff like editors. And they start to, when I give them tasks, they're not thinking about just like doing it, you know, like, oh, let me just put all these in order. No, they're starting to really think like, if I was cutting, in what order would I need this, right? And I also like it because once they get to be really pretty advanced and really they're, they're there trying to get the next job, once they're pretty advanced, we can stop talking about the assisting job and we can start talking together about character and story and motivation and audience manipulation. These are really getting into the weeds of editing. This is like, you know, at what point is the scene this character's and at what point does it change to this character's and where do we as an audience want to be at which point? Those are like the conversations that I really, really, really start to enjoy and what I find, I'm not going to mention names, but what I find lately, um, and that, that's going to qualify this a lot. No, uh, what I mean by lately is in the last several years when I became more aware of it, is that you'll talk to some directors and some producers and it's like phew, about that kind of thing. And that's what's scary because it's like, hey man, this is your story. This is your vision, your dream. And I'm asking you a question about like, you know, content. I'm asking you a question about motivation and sometimes they can't answer. And what I want is I want an assistant who really starts to get to that point because that's when they're going to become an integral storyteller. That's when they're going to be really, really a partner in the process. You know, not just a, a worker bee, not just a pair of hands or the help. They're going to be really, really a part of, of the storytelling. And to me, you know, like I said, Terry, you've caught some of the, the stuff that I really, really love. I mean, back to like loving basketball. I mean, I watched that movie not too long ago. And I was like, you know, I mean, it's, and just like, it was so funny when Terry was talking, cause she's like, I moonwalked and I saw, and I'm like, of course it's George Bowers. Who else would it be? He was the only one, right? You know? And so, I don't know, I'm sorry. I don't mean to take up the time, but that's how I started. I, I, I went off on a tangent. I'm sorry, I do that a lot. But, um, but yeah, it's like, that's how I started it. I didn't know, you know, what was available to me, but I started hanging out. I got into a job where I could hang out with, you know, the, the department that I wanted. And then what I realized is that de this department editorial, you spend day hours, days, weeks, months, years sometimes with above the line people and you really get to know them. And, and, and I, I stress with other editors that I try to stress with other editors, let your assistant be a part of your, of your circle because that's how they are going to get a relationship. And I stress with assistants, don't be, I mean, look, if you work for an editor who stresses this, maybe you need to start working for another editor. 
Um, but I'm not cool with the don't be seen and be seen and not heard kind of that's bullshit to me, you know, but yeah. you also have to learn to work the room. You have to learn when to speak up and when to keep your mouth shut. One thing I'll say too is I had an, uh, an editor who told me a long time ago, look, I really want to hear your opinion, but if it means that you're going to make more work for me, tell me in private, don't tell me when everybody else is in the room. Yeah. I agree with that. And it, so I hope people are understanding and hearing from Kelly and from some of these other people that um, it's a lot of social skills. It's a lot, it's, it's a lot of, of work in the room, reading the room, knowing when to shut up, knowing when to talk. Um, this interview I did with Felicia Livingston, she said, I did everything I could. I would sit at the foot of the editor to take notes, to be in the room, to be able to hear what the notes were. I would sit in the hallway in the doorway if it was too full. You've got to get in that room. Um, Daisha, how did you get in? Um, I think there's probably like two steps to getting in for me because I got in as a reality TV editor and then getting into the union and scripted was a whole other uh, process and a harder one. And I think uh, I went to undergrad for computer engineering because I used to build computers when I was 14 like that was my thing I used to take them apart and put them back together and add like things to them and that's it. so I thought that that's what I wanted to do um but then I graduated and then I took a job in a paralegal office and wanted to die and and I knew why it was because my passion was film and I was like I have to get back to that so I went to grad school and uh to film school at Chapman University and then I was like interning the whole time I was there um my last internship was at bravo which i got after like three rounds of interviews um and then i honestly it was it's it wasn't like who i know because i just submitted an application to reality tv companies that i i saw and one of them called me back to work on keeping up with the kardashians which i didn't know was still on the air like i was really confused by that um <laughs> But it was to be an assistant editor, and it was because I was an assistant editor in my internship at Bravo. So I put that on my resume. They hired me. I, I went to an interview with like five people in the room and sat there and kind of sold myself as someone who, you know, knew the technical side, um, knew AVID, because at my school we, we ran AVID, uh, only AVID, and we had to like learn it back and forth. Um, and then I spent, I think like five or six years, I spent two years assistant editing in reality. And then I got bumped to edit, um, which I did because I was eavesdropping. I was eavesdropping on a conversation about a pod deal that the company had with Charlize Theron. And she was, uh, I think it was like Denver and Delilah was gonna like start doing a reality TV and they needed assistant editors to cut sizzles for it. And I was on my computer and I emailed the VP of post-production as soon as I heard it. And I was like, I want to cut it. And he emailed me back. He was still in the meeting and he emailed me back and he was like, okay, you start Monday. Like this, just like that. And so now I'm off of my job as an assistant editor and I have to be an editor cutting the sizzle. Uh, thankfully I did a really good job, got bumped to editor, but it was, it was mostly just me like, constantly with my ear to what was happening in the company and trying to make that move. Then I was an editor for what felt like forever doing a reality TV and I got a little too comfortable with it because it's pretty good money. It was editing. It was what I wanted to do, but it wasn't necessarily like as fulfilling as I needed it to be. So got all my hours together, joined the union. Um, and then like Braden said, kind of promoted myself to whoever would listen, um, went to things, met people. I remember I like walked up to Ava DuVernay at a thing with, and shook her hand with my card in it. <laughs> I was like, I don't even know what this card says. <laughs> like, I knew it had my name and my email on it and that was it. Um, but like, I think that for me, it was mostly, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily about who I know. And the thing that I think is so interesting about that is I'm sure most of the black people in this room know white people, they know Asian people, they know Indian people. We all know people of different races, but white people in this industry 
can go a week, a month, a year, 10 years without knowing anyone of color, which is like, it's wild, but like, it's not the same for us. So it's, I think it's, that's what makes it a little bit harder. Um, eventually, the way I got into scripted was uh, a producer, Denise Davis, I met with her because I, I was calling around and trying to meet people. I met with her, we had uh, coffee and it was just a general meeting. And I was like, you know, I just really needed to sit in front of someone and tell them why I need to be the one to do this because my resume says reality TV, but that's not the extent of what I can do. Um, but a lot of people will see that on paper and think that that's just it. And they'll, you know, put you on shows that you don't necessarily want to do. So went out, met with as much people as possible. Denise hit me up three years later. Um, I had transitioned into assistant editing and scripted at that point. Um, and she hit me up about uh, doing a Black Lady sketch show. Before that, uh, Hillman Grad Productions hit me up to uh, cut the pilot for 20s, which I thought, when they called me, I was like, to assist? And they were like, no, 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 like, we want you to, to cut it. And I was like, why are they calling me? Like, um, and even then, I felt like I went into the interview for this, this pilot, and I was like, they're not going to hire me. I don't have the resume. Um, there was a white guy walking out of the room as I walked in. And it's just like, you know, there's constantly like that, that fear of like, am I good enough for this? Um, but yeah, they, I mean, I think it's like, eventually someone has to say yes to you. Um, especially if you go into this industry, not knowing anyone, like I really didn't know anyone. So it's, it's really about getting in front of people and then not to sound like Lady Gaga at all, but like just to that one person really has to say yes and advocate for you to the people above who are asking them, like, why should I hire this person? You know, um, so I, I think I got lucky in that I met the right people. But yeah, it took like six or seven years to to get where I am now. But it's it's solely based on like really dope women, honestly, that uh, who took a chance on me and saw something in me and uh, decided to let me come play. Was the um, post soup that gave you the trailer job, was that Dan Daub, Daniel Daub? No. No, I was just trying to remember. No, no, sorry. Were you, okay. Um, uh, Kristen, how did you break in? Oh, I mean, you know, as I said, um, it was the whole, uh, ABC Studios Production Associates program, which um, it just happened to be that we were the last class of the program, which I was so sad about because it was amazing. And for me, I'm from Indiana. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's been to India. I, I, you know, I, there's not, to, to me, I always love filmmaking, but um, I just never thought of it as a career. Like, I don't know what I thought. I thought people just kind of donated their time. Like, I never, <laughs> I never thought people like made money to like work on movies. So I I didn't even, it wasn't a thought for me, but I always had this interest in filmmaking. Um, so when I was working on my master's, I decided that I was going to take a break from, I was working on my master's, but I was also working for the Department of Defense at the same time. And I decided that I was gonna take that summer to either like take one course or like, I don't know, a seminar or something. And I saw that USC offered their six week program. Um, and it just happened to be like in documentary filmmaking. But I was like, okay, cool. I don't have to like write a script or anything. I don't wanna write anything. I just have to like shoot, like this will be a great introduction. I, I went in to this day, I was sitting um, on the first day of class, like, what am I doing here? I don't know any of this terminology. I don't know what a daily is or I don't know anything. I was like, this is a mistake. I called my mom like immediately. I was like, I need to come home. <laughs> like I'm so scared. I think they're gonna, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but you know, I think I just dived in and I was like, whatever, I'm just gonna sit here. I'm just gonna learn what I have to learn. Um, and I became obsessed with Avid. 
like they kind of just throw you in a like five hour long class to like kind of learn Avid for the summer course. And I just became obsessed with it like day in and day out. Like I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping and um, I was just on the Avid. And it got to the point where my teacher was like, oh my gosh, like you got to chill. <laughs> and so at the end of the program, she was like, you really need to leave the government. Um, I really feel like you should come to LA. Um, anything that you want to do, if you want to go to film school, I will like try to help you. Any recommendations you need. I didn't get into any film schools, which made sense. Like I didn't have any type of background besides like this little like summer course. Um, but then I heard about the production associates program and them taking people who didn't have a background in filmmaking. I didn't think I had a shot. They called me, um, told me I was a finalist, I had to come to LA. And when I got into the interview, they were like, uh, we're, we were just curious, like, you work for the government, like, you're a mathematician, like, why are you here? We just really wanted to just pick your brain. And I was like, uh, I don't know, like, I'm obsessed with filmmaking, like, I, I love editorial, and I, I don't know, I've always, it's just been my thing. And I remember going into that interview, um, just with the notion of, like, either I'm going to get it or I'm not, but either way, it doesn't really make a difference, so I'm just going to be my complete self and just be as genuine as possible and they called me like 30 minutes after my interview and was like we want you like we want to work with you we want to bring you here and you know give you this opportunity and it completely changed my life um you know i say to people all the time that like never in a million years did i think i would be doing this like to me this is my dream job every day but um yeah so those people really made a difference in my life they to this day i still talk to them at abc the entire year was i, I learned what, i learned what a dailies was what dailies were you know i learned like you know network cuts yo cuts um just how editors are high which was really cool because i saw i see i saw a lot of the names that you guys see on the panel right now like in the um abc database that i was like managing of resumes and i was like man this is so cool look at these people's resumes um yeah, so I, I did that for the year. Um, I got to sit in on scoring sessions. They let me shadow different post teams for weeks at a time where I would sit with editors and assistant editors. Um, and it was great. And that also helped me build my network just within that one year. Um, so that was my way kind of into the industry. But as Deja said, like, I had a very, I was had a very difficult time, like making that jump also from PA to assistant editor or like going from reality into scripted. You know, luckily for me, I started off with my contacts being in scripted. So they were always keeping, you know, an eye on me. Like, hey, like, okay, we got you this PA job. We know that you want to get to the chair eventually, but you're going to have to get like your days for the union. I worked in reality for about four months. And at this time, uh, I, I was also like an extreme workaholic. I double dipped a lot. Um, I worked at Moviola, which I'm not sure if people are familiar with Moviola, but they offer different um, editorial courses. So I was an intern at Moviola, but I was also PA, um, and I would do like extra shifts like on the weekend. And I ended up meeting this girl who had just moved to Los Angeles, and she became like one of my really, really good friends um, in the industry. Uh, and so I, I told her about the, um, the ACE, uh, internship. She ended up getting it a few months later. Um, we had lost contact for several months, but we randomly crossed paths. She was like, hey, I got that internship that you told me about. She was like, there's so much like I want to tell you like so much that like I want to like show you and like I really want you to build your network. And she did. And so from then on, she was like, we're just going to like, you should just come to events. Like just come to this and I was always like one of maybe two or three people of color going to these events, you know, and it was terrifying. Um, but it helped me really, really build my network. And from there, she got me my first um, apprentice editor union gig. At the same time, I was working in reality still nights. So I double dipped, meaning I was working during the day, um, this union job, and then I was working at night overnight um, in reality television. And I did this for the next like four months or so but that kind but that was my first 
break into the union. So, I mean, you know, the network thing is, it's huge, but I think that it's really, really scary. And it was also an insecurity with me. Like, I just didn't, you know, I didn't know, I didn't have the film thing. And I thought everybody went to film school because everybody I met when, you know, that were doing things in the industry that I wanted to do. They came from film school. And so I was just always nervous to be in those spaces. Like, you know, what, what did I know? What could I bring? You know, what was so unique or what I just didn't know. And so um, being able to break down those barriers and be able to step outside of like your comfort zone and being social um, really, really just makes a huge difference. And it did for me um, crossing over and doing, uh, getting into union work and yep. breaking in in general. Um, yeah, that social thing is super important. I just wanted to acknowledge that Roger has signed on to the, um, the group. Uh, hi, Roger. How are you? Can you unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself to, we've got about 100 people listening in and a panel of about eight that you're part of. Maybe. I see his face down there. Well, maybe we'll get back to Roger. Let's try, uh, Paul, how did you break into the industry? Uh, very clumsily. Um, I just, uh, oh, somebody got audio. Oh, anyway, um, I, it was just weird. Like, um, I was going to the events and everything all through LA and, uh, you know, the Ace Edit Fest and, and, um, some, some other things. And a friend had told me about uh, the, the ACE um, uh, program for, for, for assistance. And I was like, well, okay, I'll try. And uh, he was like, you got to, Paul, they don't have any black people. And I was like, well, maybe I should just let that be. <laughs> um, but I did it. And, you know, I got put in front of, of some people and they didn't select me. Uh, but from that, there were, you know, there's always people in the periphery. People are always watching in this industry, and that's my understanding. Um, and there were a few people who were, were privy to, to that interview process for me, and they, were, they just, they, they made a way for me. Um, one, of those, uh, one of those editors, she's like, okay, you didn't, get the, you didn't get in the program, but I'll make sure you get to, you know, at least sit in a room and, and, and see what they do. So uh, she set me up uh, for a week on a sh uh, television show and you know, I was thankful, kept taking notes and everything. I just went about my business. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. Uh, I was like, oh, I just gotta keep grinding. So I did and I found myself uh, kind of being a runner in commercials um, and you know, slowly moving along. And, and I just was like, okay, well, I know I still want to be in features. Um, and before I get into it, that's my big point. You got to know where you want to go. Um, and that'll help you um, as far as breaking in. Um, and I know I wanted to be in features. Um, but my big thing was like, I felt so insecure about not knowing the process. Because uh, you know, I didn't, like I said, I didn't go the film school route. Um, and that's how I ended up at, at PhotoCam and stayed there for a while. And while I was at PhotoCam, um, I got a call from a friend who I had interviewed for a PA job. Um, and it was my, my big, it was my first feature. Um, and it was funny because I had interviewed for a PA with the same group. Um, so my first feature break was a uh, girl with a dragon tattoo. And I interviewed to be the PA on a social network. And, uh, to what Kristen was saying, you just got to be yourself uh, throughout this entire process. Be authentic to you. I'm from Baltimore. My dad, you know, was a cop. My mom worked for the mayor. So there's a way that you present yourself, right? So I interviewed for the PA job with the social network in a three-piece suit. And people tell this story now, and I get laughed out at all events. <laughs> and I was like, that's me. That's how I, that's how I learned to present myself. Um, but it also made me memorable. You know, and people were like, yeah, we laugh at Paul. He had a three-piece suit on for a PA job, but we know that dude really wants it, right? <laughs> so some people, again, people always watching and listening, you know, people will pay attention. And then uh, that same group 
was like, um, well, look, we can't hire you for the PA. Like, you, you're a little too strong, got some skills. Like, get out there, get your days, and we'll, you know, think about you later. Uh, and they did. And uh, that gentleman was uh, Tyler Nelson. Um, he was a longtime Fincher assistant. Um, they gave me the call for Girl with the Dragon, Dragon Tattoo, and I was, uh, you know, able to start my learning process. But it, it wasn't clean. I think about the lead up to just building those opportunities. Um, and, you know, my, my philosophy, the thing that I always tell myself is like, when you're in the dark, you got to bang on all the doors to find the, I mean, you got to bang on all the walls to find the door because you can't see it. You don't know what, what's going to open up for you. So you just got to try everything. Yeah. Uh, Roger, are you with us? Can, uh, Simon, can you unmute him and see whether we, we've got I Roger? think I think I'm here, guys. Can you hear me? Hey, there. Yeah. Hey, Roger. Hey, everyone. Sorry, I'm uh, a little bit late. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, just hey, Paul. Uh, joined the tail end of that. Um, are we, uh, you know, sharing uh, all of our stories? I mean, I'm, kind of, I'm yeah, sure. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm here to do an awful lot of listening and I'm glad, I'm, I apologize for being late. I just had, I was driving down the mountain and finally got cell coverage. Um, so definitely here as much to listen um, as I am to uh, help and share my own, you know, stories, uh, whatever, whatever helps. Can you tell us a little bit about what your position is right now? Uh, sure. So um, when COVID hit, um, sorry, I'm going to turn my car off here. Um, prior to COVID hitting, I had a staff job at Walt Disney um, where they, after about 23 years of, you know, climbing the editorial ladder and getting to a place where I was cutting features for several years, um, I had a good experience with Disney when I was, uh, uh, I did the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie and forged some pretty positive relationships with the creative execs over there. And so in the fall, as I was finishing up a movie uh, that I cut for Michael Bay, uh, they reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be staff um, with, uh, with Disney. And I said, uh, absolutely. I mean, after doing, the editorial grind for 25 years. Uh, I was ready for a change. Um, there, there's a whole separate discussion, you know, which um, is happening in our industry right now about uh, working conditions, uh, working hours, unnecessary travel, and I think it's all very positive and will will benefit the entire industry if we can talk through some of these issues. But then COVID hit. And uh, I kind of saw the writing on the wall because uh, they sent everybody home and they were paying me for a couple of weeks just sitting at home. And I was thinking to myself, well, this is not going to last long. So I started to put out feelers. And uh, luckily, um, there was a film that Paramount was doing called The Tomorrow War uh, that Chris McKay is directing. And... Uh, I got the call from Disney that Friday was going to be my last day, and I got the call from Paramount that they wanted me to start on Monday. So, um, you know, I, there are so many reasons why I am uh, consider myself one of the luckiest people uh, in this industry, and that's just another example. Um, but it's certainly not without having paid uh, a fair amount of dues at the same time. And I heard, you know, some of uh, a young lady, I, I don't know who it was, was describing, you know, her path and Paul's path about not being that person who was in a traditional or a conventional film school. And neither was I. I had, I had no family that had any connections to Hollywood or uh, anything creative at all. And I knew that that you know, a, a, I knew a traditional accounting path was certainly not in my future. And so, um, you know, I went to college and, and knew I wanted to do something creative, but I had no idea what it was going to be. And I just started, and this is one thing that I would urge, you know, uh, any young editor um, to do, which is um, put yourself in situations you're uncomfortable in and, and, you know, 
Um, speaking from my perspective, you know, I know that varies, uh, you know, greatly uh, with a lot of people that are on on the Zoom call. For me, what that meant was putting myself in a situation where I was surrounded by people who were going to USC and UCLA and NYU and had all these, you know, very sought after and um, impressive, uh, you know, school experiences that I wish I would have had. And I still wish I would have had it um, because it, it does, it does provide you with a, a, a a background, I wouldn't say it's a necessary background, but a, a background and it, it, it would help you. And I've been in so many uncomfortable situations where people are talking about what, you know, uh, um, what this scene meant in this film, like what was the underlying, you know, um, uh, meaning of this and that. And, and you know, I've, taken as, as I came up you know I just watched film like everybody else and I often would just take what I was watching at face value and and so surrounding my myself with these people opened my eyes and um, I was always that that person who was doing I think a bit more than other people around me um, I remember when I first started out, I would use uh, Microsoft Word and I would send out 200 cover letters along with my resume, you know, based on, um, you know, just as many addresses to, to independent production companies as I would get. And, you know, every day in the mail, I would get 10 or 15 rejection letters back. And those were the people that even bothered to write me back. But eventually a door is gonna open and um, that's what happened for me. And, and, um, and so there were a lot of rungs in the ladder that I you know, had, to, had to climb. Um, and initially I got involved in, um, I mean, my first ever job was being a production assistant for a dating show called The Love Connection. Um, followed by um, I, uh, being a segment producer on a show called Stunt Masters, where I would shoot these behind the scenes Entertainment Tonight type videos. But my favorite part of that process was always bringing my mediocre footage back to an editing room and watch this editor like literally save my ass um, and you know make me look like a rock star. Um, and so I thought, wow, this is really where everything comes together. Um, and so I knew that's where I wanted to be. And so I started to put out, um, you know, feelers in the, in the few relationships that I had at that point. And then, you know, sure enough, someone said there was a 10 hour documentary, non-union, uh, being cut on a brand new system called an Avid. And, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm sure that's going to date me a little bit, but that's all right. Um, and so uh, I, I took that job and it, you know, the pay was of course, you know, uh, quite low. And, um, but that was an incredible experience because I was able to latch onto a technology early on in my career. And there were very few people at that point who knew that technology. Um, guys, I'm in my car. I've got to put you on hold, uh, one sec. Hey, Simon, can you, um, can you, uh, Carry the conversation for about one I, minute. I want to. I want to move this over to Terry. Terry, quickly. Um, Terry, can you tell us how you broke into the industry? And then I want to. I definitely want to get to some of these questions from people. Yeah, I don't. I want. I don't want to spend too much time talking about uh, my trajectory as much as it, it. You know, in terms of being able to help um, everybody here. That you know, because uh, I came up at a different time, and that there are some things that still are relatable, but I, I too want to get us to where we can have some conversations with the people. What I will say is, is that what, um, and I forgot whether it was Simon who said it or Brayden about the good news and the bad news is there's just not one way in. 
Um, and in some ways it would be easier if you did this, 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 this can guarantee you that you're going to get in the chair or, or what, whatever you choose to do. I mean, for me, I, I, like I said, I, I, uh, even though I was editing in college, it wasn't the first thing I did coming out. I actually worked on an industrial for the postal service where, um, I was, um, working kind of as the production coordinator on it. But the director who was working on it, I talked to him about how I was interested in editing. So at the end of the production, he turned me on to the editor who was putting together the industrial. And that was, you know, one way that I found my way into that editing room. And at the time, I know this sounds crazy, but he was cutting 16 and I, had, you know, and so even in trying to get jobs um, on other projects, um, people were saying, well, have you had 35 experience? Um, so I had to, you know, basically work in a cutting room for free um, so that I could get my hands on 35, even though, you know, 16 and, and, and Super 8 and things that I, was, I grew up on editorially were much harder to handle. But what, what made a difference, I think, in two key parts of me connecting with an editor that ultimately got me a job was exactly kind of what we're doing here which is I went to a panel, I think it was at UCLA at the time, and it had Carol Littleton on it and Rich Mar uh, Richie Marks and um, Michael Kahn was on it. And, um, and I believe, and uh, one of the editors who I ended up working with, Anne Gersow was on the panel. And then, and then during a lunch break of the panel, um, I was sitting at a table and there weren't many tables to be had. And so an editor came up with another uh, colleague and said, can we share your table? And that editor was the next editor that I worked with. Um, I, I struck up a conversation, we started talking. I said, if you ever you know, are looking for somebody, uh, here I am. And it took probably three to six months and I got a call from her first assistant asking me if I, you know, come in for an interview. And so in some ways, what you guys are doing here today is exactly what you should be doing. When there is Edit Fest, you should be going to Edit Fest. If you, if it, and now that you know, we're in our COVID cray world, where we're in our homes, um, Edit Fest is virtual this year. Um, there was a, an Adobe Tech Fest this weekend um, you know, that people could have, I think it was open to, to I'm not sure if it, I, I think it was open to everybody, I'm not sure. So. Sorry if it, but there's a number of different um, environments in which you are meeting or having this kind of conversation with editors. What I would also say is, you know, do your homework. It's not always just about connecting with editors. Honestly, often when I'm looking for somebody, I'm calling, yes, I'm calling my editor colleagues, but I'm also checking in with my assistants and my former assistants. Paul can tell you, I have a few assistants that are on this and they're that have worked with me. And, and trust me, they've gotten the call. I'm looking for, do you have somebody that you know? And so I think it's really important also for you guys to start doing your homework. You have IMDB, you have, you know, you have any number of ways to look at a credit list, see who was working in post-production, who was the post-production supervisor, who was the, um, who was the assistant editor, who was the second assistant editor? Oh, by the way, who was the post PA? You know, these are people who have already established relationships with the editor and, and so often not, you know, often even with a director. And so you have, if you can't get to me or you can't get to Kelly or you can't get to Simon, there are people that we work with that are, you know, everybody's on their own trajectory. And I think it's important to realize that those people are working towards the same thing you are. And I think it's important for you not to just you know, I, look, it's, I would love to be able to connect with everybody, but, you know, we are human beings who have lives and families and things that we're doing and, you know, and, and I, try, you know, you want to try to do that, but there's so many different ways to connect, you know, and I, I, I urge you to take advantage of, you know, different types of panels and it doesn't even have to always be editors. I mean, sometimes I'm checking in on a, a panel with cinematographers or I'm, I'm checking these networking places like free the work and and prime time and there's a lot of new networking um, uh, uh, things that are going on and film independent is another one that is extremely important um, uh, that are that are putting you know 
connect people that are connected. And um, this is this is a really good time because a lot of us are at home, and um, you know we're not uh, we're kind of all in a holding pattern. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to say very quickly. The other thing that is really important that you can be doing right now is working on your tools, working not only just you know, working on your, uh, you know, Premiere, working on your Avid, working on watching movies. Um, there's any number of, this is, we're all kind of in this holding pattern. And I find myself like, okay, what, what do I need to get better at? Um, you know, this is a craft. You're always trying to hone the skill. You're always trying to prepare yourself for whatever may be coming up. And so um, as far as I, I, you know, my, my how I got here, um, it, it was, like I said, it was a lot of opportunities and taking advantage of those opportunities and doing the job well. And so that when someone was looking for somebody else, they said, oh, you know, uh, check out Terry Shropshire. She's, you know, she's somebody that you might want to interview with. Um, but as far as, uh, I, I just want to encourage everybody to, to realize that there's just not one way in. And it is possible because every single one of us that's here has shown you that it is possible and um yeah sorry can i say something oh. yeah can go I, for it kelly something about what terry was saying too um you know this is gonna i don't mean this to come as a big blow but there's two things you don't you can't go to these events and expect to talk to us and all of a sudden think that we might have a job right then that's the only thing. And, you know, I know that, you know, everybody wants to get in and I understand that, but, you know, you have to kind of go to these things and hope to maybe say hi and tell us, you know, maybe a little bit about yourself. I mean, there's people that I've met on here. Kristen, I think I met you at a thing. At the you end. did. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I didn't think you were going to remember me. <laughs> I, I do. So, so that's the thing. It's like you can't have the expectation that, Ooh, oh my God, Terry's right there. Oh my God, I'm a fan of all her movies. It almost comes off like stalking. It's a little kind of weird. And, you know, and then expect that, you know, Terry, oh my God, I would love to work for you. Oh, great. Can you start tomorrow? Look, that might happen, but I doubt it. So don't come to these events and expect that there's going to be a job right there. The key is to, you know, introduce yourself let people know a little bit about you. I don't know if she's on this, you know, here, but like a friend of mine, I mean, and I didn't know her. I met her at like maybe three or four edit fests. Um, she's an editor. She just cut the photograph. Her name is Shannon. She's cool, right? But I, like, I didn't know her, but she, every edit fest or event, she would come up to me and say, hey, how are you doing? I'm, you know, do you remember me from blah, blah, blah? I'm doing this now. And, you know, I watched her career go up and some people ask like, how do you get a mentor? That's how you get a mentor. It's not that we're not going to be like, you know, somebody on the phone constantly, maybe, you know, maybe you might get lucky, but maybe not. It's like usually over time, you know, and the other thing um, that I was going to mention um, that Terry, you kind of touched on, fuck, I did it again. What was it? <laughs> um, oh, is, is that, you know, like, look, I'm only speaking for myself, so I'm not, you know, necessarily speaking for any of the other editors on here, but a lot of times we may have a list of people that are sort of in line for the next time that we might have an opening, right? It's not like, you know, there, there are people that, you know, that we've come up with and say, hey, you know what, I'd really like to work with you. Hey, I'd like to work with you too. The next time I get something, I'll see if you're available. So you have to understand that, you know, for editors, you know, a lot of times you may have like people in line that you can't necessarily jump in front of those people. But, you know, meeting somebody, like I said, I met Kristen at this Emmy. It was like, it was I'm good. Emmy. see, I know. Yeah. See, and that's the thing. And like, I met Terry one time, I think it was the first time I met you was like, at an ace Christmas party, right? You know, but I mean, you know, it's like people will remember that, but you can't come in, you have to like kind of quell your ex expectations a little bit. That's it, sorry. Yeah, quell expectations. And also um, we don't need to know that you're the world's greatest editor that I get that all the time. Like you should look at my reel and you need to look at my latest short film. I'm like, 
I'm not looking for an editor. I'm looking for an assistant editor. These are very different skill sets. Um, I wanted to get to uh, a question from uh, Sushila Love. Can you, um, Simon, can you unmute her? If she's still online, she talked about roadblocks. I'd love to hear what she wanted to ask. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, my name is Sushila Love, and I was just thinking about roadblocks that I personally had in my um, recent jump in the last few years from an assistant editor to an editor. Um, I did notice, and listening to what Daisha was talking about earlier uh, in the reality TV space, um, there were a lot more black people and people of color in reality TV. And then when I moved finally over years uh, of trying to network within that space to scripted, it almost dropped to zero people of color, let alone black people who I was working with and around uh, other than maybe a PA or something. Um, so I feel like I'm not sure how much of a roadblock that still is considering now we're in COVID and it's a new normal and people who are not available previously because they were working constantly are now available. So networking has kind of really opened up. I feel personally in the last several months in a way that I'd never experienced prior to this. And in a way I feel like COVID is going to help a lot of us kind of connect with each other because um, one of the other roadblocks was simply not knowing that I didn't know other black people who were working in the edit rooms. Um, Cause I knew a few and I would go to different um, networking events and black, uh, the, the steering committee for African-American steering committee at the uh, editors guild and other mixers and just unrelated to diversity, but other film or television related events. And you'd see like, a brown dot here and there, but it wasn't like, there was no easy way. And I actually had done Google searches and stuff to see like, who is a black editor? Who is an editor of color? You can kind of tell who's a woman or a man from IMDB, but you can't tell much more than that. And just cause it's a black movie doesn't mean a black person edited it. So I found that that was kind of a really big roadblock in having been someone coming not from film school. Cause I never, knew I was gonna be an editor um, and learning on the job and not having people who I knew in the industry, but simply building my networks. And another roadblock I've noticed is that I feel like when I did networking as someone in reality, I couldn't really use a lot of those connections in scripted. So I had to rebuild that new network in scripted. And then I built it as an assistant editor. And then I had to rebuild it again as an editor because a lot of people, even if you were really good at being an AE, think of you always as a technical tool rather than a creative mind who may, despite you constantly saying, I want to be an editor, let me put together scenes. I've already assembled this for you. You know, like do I'm staying late to like do extra stuff outside of my AE hours. And I want to show you that I have the desire and I have the drive and I have the skills and I just need some mentorship and, you know, just a, a few minutes of your time. And a lot of times people just don't have time, even if they want to help you. So that's another big roadblock. And uh, go ahead. yeah, so anybody on the panel want to kind of address that uh, and any of those roadblocks that she mentioned um, specifically, yeah. like if, if you've got an editor assistant that really wants to work, what can you, what can you do? How can that person move up and prove themselves? Yeah, there's, um, I would say because the networking part of it is such a huge thing. Uh, to add to that roadblock, um, shout out to anyone in here who has like social anxiety and can't do that. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, it's not, yeah, like I, it's, it's not easy to jump outside of yourself every time you have to go to an event and walk up to a complete stranger and not immediately pitch yourself because like uh like kelly said like it's it's sometimes we don't want to hear that we just want to get to know you and it can be awkward and weird and hard for you you know so there's there's definitely that aspect of it um rebuilding your network over and over and over again because even if you're working for an editor that might want to move you up they might have their own roadblocks in doing that because I want to hire you. There's been so many assistant editors that I've wanted to hire, but it's not, it doesn't always fall on me. I have to get them approved um, 
on the way up. So it's, it's, it's not always on me. Um, and then sometimes you'll be working with an editor and years later, you'll realize that person does not want you to move up. <laughs> and it's, it's not, not every editor is a mentor and you have to sometimes find that out the hard way. But I think that that's another interesting and yet difficult part of being an assistant editor is like realizing who you're on this team with, right? Um, and I honestly think it's just about communication. Just honestly, just like you said, say what you want, say it over and over and over again, you know, show up, uh, stay late. Like you said, like cut as much as say, Hey, can you look at this thing that I cut? Um, stay ready whenever they, they might need help because they've been working, you know, 16 hours and, you know, some, a scene is like falling behind, like say, Hey, I can pick that up if you want me to, <laughs> like there's, if, if you need help, I'm here, you know, um, I think a lot of times we might get beside ourselves because we're so, you know, passionate and you definitely, you want the job and you want to move up. But I think that everyone has, you know, their, their, their time and place for it. And you might not necessarily be in the right situation for you. Um, and so part of it is like sussing that out, like trying to figure out like what, what you're, if you've been in your situation for too long and you really feel like you've been putting in the work and you're hitting roadblock after roadblock, try to figure out what that is. Like try to, you know, talk to your, your, your people and figure out what exactly is it that's keeping me from, from, from getting to where I need to be. Um, but I definitely, I, yeah, I definitely feel that there is roadblocks everywhere. And sometimes you walk into a job and you're the only black person there or the only person of color there. And that feels like a roadblock, right? Because you're instantly uncomfortable. Um, and that's not true for everybody, but sometimes you're, you're instantly uncomfortable. I've been spoiled. Like the past three jobs I've worked has been like black women everywhere. <laughs> and it's been amazing. But before that, I know what that was like as well. So I think it's definitely like when, for me, whenever I got in those situations, I had to just focus on the work, focus on the work, get to know as many people as you can in that gig, in that position. And like I said, constantly be uh, someone that they want to be around, someone that they can rely on um, because you're constantly, you know, doing your job, doing it well. Um, and then, yeah, just after that, it's just making, making the moves necessary, but don't let those roadblocks keep you mentally from getting to where you need to be. Sometimes you just have to go around them. Anybody else on the panel? I also want to say, like, just touching on what Deja said, um, being able to compart compartmentalize things. I do that a lot. Like, I go into spaces and um, I'm able, I, I think there's a level of confidence, of course, that comes uh, just with being in these spaces a certain number of times that you probably have to build up to. But now I make it a point. <laughs> I do this a lot, like, before I go into work. I might sit in my car just a few minutes and just be like, let me just center myself. Like, I know who I am. I know what I can bring. I know what I can do. And anything I don't know, I have a bomb network. I'll text somebody. I'll fi I will figure it out. I'm a master troubleshooter. There's nothing that I can't do. Um, and I think that being able to know that about yourself and being able to identify what you feel are weaknesses about yourself and address those early on um uh, really comes in handy you know uh, i've been assisting of course my eventual goal is to get into the chair but i you know i believe that there's 10 million ways to do that right so i try to think of different ways to do that with every either with every job i take or whether it be the side projects that i decide to take on because like a lot of people you know a lot, i know a lot of people who became editors and were never assistants were never pas never did any of that and they just were editors you know that's all that they knew and it was because of the connection that they had with the director or with the producer and the timing was just right um i think that being able to figure out which route that you want to take which i think is something that paul touched on um early on like knowing what you want to do um would really really help you for me it was really important that i do all these other roles you know i i it was really really important for me i was like i want to be a pa 
you know, like I, I wanted to work, you know, the corporate job, like first and time. I wanted to do all of these things, you know, before I went about going into the chair. And for me, I haven't really worked with um, the same editor a lot of times, which is, you know, can be rare for a lot of assistants. And that's because I wanted to work with a lot of different editors. I wanted to learn different styles, different types of shows, different types of things like that. Um, but yeah, knowing what you want to do and just knowing what you can bring to the table will definitely help with some of the um, the anxiety that kind of happens in the workplace and especially attending these social settings, you know. A lot of my friends will tell me, oh my gosh, like, you're so social. Like, I see you in these atmospheres. Like, you're talking to everybody. You're doing this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if only you knew, like, what I had to do, like, what I tell myself in my brain, like, how I'm wigging out, like, right before I walk through this door. Like, it is, in a way, like, it's kind of a facade, but, like, you have to you have to get to that, well, not that you have to, I'm sorry, I don't believe in have to's, but, um, you know, you, you have to get to a level of just comfortability, comfortability with yourself, you know. Yeah. Does anybody else on the, on the panel want to address any of these roadblocks for her? I will say the, uh, the anxiety thing is definitely very real. Um, like some of the environments I've been in, you know, like everybody else, I've been like the only black person there. And uh, I, I say, what helped me was I was always trying to be a better assistant because I felt like being a better assistant, of course, you get into like the, the best opportunities and you get to learn the craft uh, from those who are working on the projects that you want to work in. Um, so I always ask myself what I don't know in the process. Um, and this is from the assistant editor side. Um, there's different questions that I ask, you know, thinking about, you know, editing now. Um, but as an assistant, I was like, what, what, what part of the process don't I know? And I remember like I had, because I wasn't with like a, like a team consistently for a while, I had holes in my knowledge. So I was always trying to fill those holes in. And I remember uh, one in particular, um, I didn't know how to do uh, a VFX turnover, like for turning over a shot, right? And I had very specific questions about like, okay, is this right? I think this is what it's supposed to be. Um, and you just kind of got to, ask people. So you always try to fill in those holes. Um, and even if it's reading stuff online or Googling it and putting information together. Um, in the military, I worked in the intelligence community. So it was a whole thing of like, oh, you take information from here and here and you put the picture together. That's what I was doing. Um, and I found eventually I did have a strong sense of the process. And that gave me the confidence to kind of overcome some of the, the anxiety. Um, building that knowledge uh, and then you start applying it and you know each job you do you get a little bit more confidence um, that was kind of what I experienced you know as I went from job to job again I didn't have somebody to say yeah that's correct or that's that's how you do it but I would do it and it was like okay that is correct or there's a new way to think about it and you just get confidence and all slowly that anxiety starts to come down um, and there are some anxieties that you're going to come across that you know are just brought about like uh, there was a, for a while, I thought I had to be perfect and nobody's going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. Um, so if you're feeling that as an assistant, you know, throw that out because you're going to mess up a turnover or something. And the point is not to break down. It's like, okay, Hey, I made that mistake. What do I have to do to fix it? You know, own up to it and then keep it moving. Um, and then socially, yeah, you're going to come across stuff like just, uh, Early in my career, some of the credits I had, you know, I met some guys um, on the studio lot and they were like, oh, yeah, we heard about your credit. And I was like, okay, cool. And they were like, yeah, we didn't think they let brothers on shows like that. Like, how'd you get on? And I was just like, all right. You know, and that kind of sticks with you a little bit. Um, and you might want to, you know, doubt yourself. But I was like, yeah, well, they do let brothers on that. <laughs> and I'm going to keep getting them. And I'm gonna keep bringing more people. <laughs> so. Amen. Uh, anybody else? I have something. Sure, Kelly. Um, you know, I I gotta. This is gonna sound really harsh, and I don't mean it to, but I'm just gonna be real about it. Um, if look, anxiety is real, and you know, talking to people, and you know, being shy and stuff like that, and and I'm not trying to say that I don't respect that because I do, 
But I think that if that is something that you know that you recognize in yourself, one of the best things to do is start getting some therapy or something and working on that. Because this is, no, I, I don't mean it to be funny and, you know, but what I mean is that this is, a, a, especially, you know, editing as far as being an integral storytelling partner, right? Unless you're working on, you know, your own stuff or you're working on documentary stuff, that's your own stuff, you know what I mean? You're working with other people. You're working either in television or work, scripted, excuse me. You're working with writers, okay? Those are the, the that's king in TV is the writers. Um, in features, it's the directors, right? Um, but you've got, they, from what I can tell on the good projects and talking to friends, I've been on good projects, I've talked to friends on good projects, that, you know, you want to be an integral part of the story. You can do, you paint with everybody else's art, unless it's the composer who usually goes after you. Everybody else has done their art before you get it. So you're painting with everybody's art and um, you need to be able to communicate and, you know, I guess uh, communicate, talk with your either director and or your writers. Um, and they're relying on you because they don't know how to push all the buttons. I think in a lot of ways, if they did, they would be, they think that they would be able to do it better than you, but that's, you know, that's not really the case, but you want to be a good, a, a storyteller along with them. And if you are having trouble communicating with them, then, you know, you're not going to be that integral part. And the other, the other thing are, along with that is in the interview process, if you are having anxiety and getting your ideas across in that interview, then the person who isn't, they might not be as good an editor as you, but they're going to get the job because th the person, just like Steve said earlier, the person that they want to spend 12 hours in the room for months, you know, is the one that's going to get the job. They might not finish the job, you know, but they're going to get the job. Um, I always say to assistants, and this is why I like to have them in the room at least an hour a day when I got producers, directors, or writers in the room so they can have those relationships. Because if they don't know you, there's no reason why they should hire you on the next thing. Um, the other thing that I will mention too, because it, it just kind of occurred to me, because um, people ask all the time about how do I get in? How do I break in? How do I get to know people? You know what? Just like Terry said, it might not be, you know, you, you, you actually gave me this idea. This is like, I mean, it just kind of blew my mind, you know, just now, Terry, because you said, go to, go to like events with cinematographers and stuff. And I'm like, damn, I, I never thought of that. But here's the thing right now, especially now, wow, is it cool to be a person of color, right? Everybody wants to hire you know, but here's the thing. They're not really thinking about editors yet because editors just work in dark rooms and they don't know them. But boy, are writers all over town getting, you know, scripted projects everywhere. You just read in the trades. Um, people of color, black writers, Latino writers, Asian writers, all of them are getting overall deals all over. And you know what? Here's the other thing that I know about writers. Most of them have never been in the editing room. Writers know writers' rooms. They do. They don't really know the post process, you know? So unless they're on a show where their showrunner helped them out and got them in the, in the editing room, most of them have never been in the editing room, right? So what is probably a good key now is start looking at the trades going, who just got an overall deal? A, fr a good friend of mine, black writer you know, has now an overall deal at Warner Brothers, has an overall deal at AMC, does a lot of writing on The Walking Dead, you know what I mean? And, you know, and my feeling is what you need, what people need to do now is start approaching some of these writers. Okay, that's TV. Writer is king in TV and features director is king. Get to know some of these directors, let them know you. It's harder in features because, you know, then they're just looking at a list and they want to hire two. But, but the thing is, is that, you know, right now, there's a lot of new writers that are getting, you know, this, a lot of this work.
and they have no idea once they start to stop to staff their show about getting you know uh, editors. Um, I wanted to, to, to Kelly. I love the, those comments. Uh, a couple of quick things about because you mentioned um, writers who are very important in um, television. Point out to those people if you get a chance to go to some you know meet a writer how how much an editor is like a writer. We are the writers on the back half of the process. And if you explain to them how similar you are, like Kelly was selling, saying, and um, I think Terry also mentioned, somebody else said they were also a journalism minor. I was a journalism person too. Right, you're writers. And I think writing and editing are very similar. And because writers are the kings in TV, it's a great way to let them feel like they can trust you. Like I am a writer, you know, I want to help you in that part of the process. Um, directors, do you think, how do I ever meet a director? I'm never going to be able to meet a director. I interview a lot of editors and one of the great ways somebody just edited a big feature film, it was because I said, how did you get that job? How did you land this director? Uh, you know, somebody that I didn't think had any, you know, background to be able to get that. And I'm not a film guy. I didn't go to film school. My parents are not in film. My mom's a nurse. My dad's a college teacher. I have no Hollywood connections whatsoever. Um, that person went to Sundance and I know not everybody can afford to go to Sundance, but there are other short films, you know, maybe in LA, there's a Latino film festival. I know in Chicago, there is one. You go to a local film festival and somebody's going to need their short film cut. And you go to that, you, 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 you go to somebody's short film presentation, you know, some short, and you go up to them and say, Hey, I really loved your short film. You, you talk to them about why it was good a little bit. And you say, if there's ever a chance that I could cut one of your short films, I would love to. And maybe you do some research and you discover that that person cut their own short film. They may want, you to cut their next short film because they had to do it themselves and they would love to pawn that off on somebody else. It's a great way to meet a director is just to go to a film festival and introduce yourself to some short film editor or short, short film director. Anybody else on the panel have ideas on, on ways to, to do, make those connections? Um, I just want to say something um, in, com in terms of talking about the, the, the nervousness and anxiety. Um, you know, I came up being the only person in the room most of my career. And what I would say about this, and it, it seems like maybe a Pollyanna way to look at it or a naive way to look at it is, you know, you have to show people who you are. You cannot assume that they're going to know that they can see how you see yourself. And if you go in and the first thing you're thinking about is, and trust me, yeah, when you first walk in and there, there is that awareness, but then at a certain point, that's not who you are. That's your place in that space, but that's not who you are. You know, when you're looking at yourself as the only person in the room, um, you know, what you have to kind of flip that switch and you have to go, okay, yeah, I'm the only person in the room. Failure was not an option coming up for me. I mean, it didn't mean that I didn't make mistakes. It didn't mean that there weren't things that I didn't know. But part of that being the only one in the room is recognizing there's a responsibility there. And, you know, and you, you're going to do everything you need to do to do the job, do the job well. And if you don't know the job, you hopefully have people in that room, if people are practicing the craft, that can help you be better, that can help you um, navigate whatever the politics or the technical is in that space. But I would encourage you not to go in um, feeling like I, oh, I'm the only one in the room. I, 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 you know, yes, be nervous, be anxious, be all those things about getting the job, you know, but don't allow the um, optics to to prevent you from showing what you're capable of, you know, because, and to that end, um, you're in a collaborative art form, which means you're going to have to communicate. And if you can't communicate 
at a panel like this, or everything you're doing right now is preparing you for what's next. And at a certain point, you're going to need to be next to a director and communicate. You're going to have to talk story. You're going to have to talk about a lot of things. And that starts with you going to a environment and being able to walk up to whoever you feel that you want to make a connection with. Now, they may not have time for you in that moment, or they may say, you know, give me your information. But if you create a roadblock for yourself, then you're living in a world where you're preventing yourself from the possibility. So I just encourage you to try to, yes, prepare yourself for whether you're going to a panel or you're going to a film festival or you're going to something like this to get past your own. And it's not easy. We all have it. But I, I just, I would hate for any of you not to make the connection with the person that you want, even again, may not be able to, you may not hear from them, you know, for a week or two weeks or two months, but part of it is, is just staying, trying to stay connected. I wrote letters back in the day. If there was a, if, if there was a filmmaker or, or somebody that I wanted to connect with, you know, I tried to find some way to connect with them. And you have to self-advocate. And I'm, I, I tend to be a broken record about this if you've heard me talk before. Yes, you hope for advocates like us that are on the panel, but you have to always be self-advocating because, you know, um, if you're not, if you're not trying to, and some, you know, get yourself to where you want to be, and if people can't see that, then it, it's hard for them to help you. You have to, you have to self-advocate. So that's my... I also just add this last thing like I wouldn't I've learned that like if it doesn't scare me then I probably shouldn't be doing it so if it's something that brings me like a lot of anxiety or I'm super nervous about the opportunity then I probably need to dive into it <laughs> it's probably some type of there's some lesson or something I need to learn about this opportunity and that's how I like to choose things I'm like man this makes me really nervous I don't know if I can do this so I'm going to do it Uh, yeah, I want to say more about that. The social aspect is the collaboration thing that Kelly was talking about is really important. If, if you don't feel like you can collaborate with people, this is a kind of a hard industry because I've, I've gotten on panel, other panels like this, people say, oh, how do you even deal with the collaboration where people don't like your editing and, and, and you know, they, they have notes and comments on it. I'm like, if, if you can't handle that, this may not be the career for you because that's all you're going to get it's, is exactly that. You have to understand that this is the whole industry, not just editing, but definitely editing. You are a collaborator and you need to have social skills and the ability to be, you know, like I love Kelly talking about, she said she didn't talk about movies, you know, she didn't talk about the movies they were editing. You know, you talk about Star Wars or whatever it is that you love, whatever you're passionate about. I see trumpets back there for Kelly. Like you go, hey, Kelly, are you a trumpet player? Do you like jazz? What, you know, tell me about yourself. I mean, you, you try to find those social things that people connect with you on a personal level. And those are the people who are going to get the jobs. Honestly, I think it is. Uh, and, and they're the people that you're going to be willing to say, hey, you don't know how to do a VFX turnover? No worries, man. I like you a lot. I'm going to teach you how to do a VFX turnover and, and then you learn. Uh, and, and I always tell my assistants two things. One, I don't care if you make a mistake, just fess up to it. And two, if you don't know something, I also don't care if you don't know it, just tell me you don't know it. And as long as I only have to tell you once, I'm happy to tell you anything. If you don't want to do a VFX turnover, let's sit down. I got five minutes. Here's how to do it. Maybe more than five minutes, but <laughs> Paul can tell you how long it takes to learn how to do a VFX journal. <laughs> what are some specific skills that are important to you guys for an assistant editor? Somebody's coming up and, and uh, what do they need to know? They need to know Avid, probably, right? Premiere, probably secondarily. Mm -hmm. Audio editing is super important, I think. VFX, being able to comp a VFX thing. What are some things to the people on this panel that the people listening might want to know, hey, this is what you really need to be able to do? Uh, well, I, you know, from a technical standpoint, I, I think a lot of people were asking in the chat about uh, programs that they should know. I mean, 
you know, I, I think Avid is, of course, the industry standard. Uh, Premier has uh, had a, a humongous rise. Every now and then you might see a Final Cut 10. Uh, it's a little rare, um, but you know, you should really know Avid and it's good to know Premiere. Um, as far as like things like After Effects, those are all very marketable skills to have. I, I know I've gotten some jobs uh, over other people because I could do things in After Effects that, uh, you know, would help the production and might not be, you know, you don't have to outsource them. Uh, and I think that's, you know, particularly an important skill to have uh, if you're doing a little more self-contained stuff like documentaries uh, or e even stuff like sizzles or shorts. Um, but, you know, piggybacking off something else you said, uh, Steve and, and, and uh, Terry said as well, uh, and Kelly, is um, it's not a, a technical skill necessarily, but I, I think, think it, it's kind of the secret other side of editing is, uh, is your political skills, not political like political parties, but your ability to navigate a creative environment uh, with multiple uh, creatives, directors, producers, EPs, like all these people, writers, all these people have uh, their notes and they have their ideas and they have uh, their opinions. And uh, any creative environment is very highly charged and people can get worked up about their ideas. And uh, that is a skill I think that's particular to editors. And I think likely assistant editors too. It's, it's something that you need to be able to navigate um, and you need to be able to uh, communicate well and you need to be able to uh, take people's ideas. You also kind of have to know who has the last call, who has that idea that you, you have to follow. Um, but th there's a there's a political landscape that you wouldn't learn in a film school, um, but you would learn it once you get on the job and you have to deal with multiple personalities. So I, th I think that's just an important skill to try to pick up. Does anybody feel like uh, FileMaker Pro is very important for their assistant editors to know, like for a code book? <laughs> yeah, not, not everybody does. That's like it's a feature thing a lot for a, while, a long time ago, right? I don't know. Not important. I don't yeah, know. I, I think it's important um, to just the way, because what I learned, um, we some of the environments I've been in, we use FileMaker heavily. Um, they're not saying it's the only solution for, for managing uh, large amounts of data like that, um, but it's the best solution that I've found for workflows. Um, because uh, in the future world, you'll have to sometimes maintain something called a code book. And it's essentially all the information that's coming in on, you know, various ALEs. And it's, you know, it's an ability to track, you know, essentially every shot that your production shoots. Um, yes. And, you know, people, they will want to recall that, that information uh, sometimes. So is it essential? I mean, no, if you can find like another solution for it, but, um, it's the best solution that I've found for, for doing the work that it does. I think that in many ways, when we talk about tools, especially as an editor and assistant relationship, um, I am someone who does not micromanage my cutting room. Now, Paul may disagree. He's been in my cutting room. Um, generally, um, I think what's important is that you need to know what is important to your editor in terms of, yeah, the tools that you feel that they're going to use. But I also find that I still am learning from my assistants. I mean, I want them, you know, I, I want them to, to, you know, have the tools that they need so that I can, so that they can do their job so that I can do my job, right? And so I think often um, those tools will change depending on the demands of the film. I think you know, often I say, you know, you can work on a, a $7 million movie or a movie that's 10 times that amount. And there's still some basic needs that all films have. They, they have basic needs. And then depending on, you know, what that particular project is, those tools will always change. And so I think it's as much as you can cast the net, and again, take time like right now, we're in a holding pattern where you can take in and hopefully, you know, learn some things you haven't learned before. 
whether you use them on this film or you use them two films from now, it never hurts to it never hurts to have um, any number of different um, things that you're that you're honing your skill with. Anybody else want to answer this question? Otherwise, I want to go ahead, Simon. Um, uh, so something that like I definitely look for it in an assistant in terms of what they bring into um, the cutting room is actually like a knowledge of uh, the, the, the medium, what films have been on, you know, what TV programs are on. Like the first thing I say when I come in on a Monday is, is what did you watch at the weekend? You know, and I, and I want to know what they've been watching. Um, in an interview, I'll be like, what, what have you watched recently? What, what, what are you into? What have you liked? Uh, music, you know, what, what musical scores have you listened to? Or, or even what contemporary music, what pop music? Are you listening to? Um, I I'm more interested in those things than I am in the avid skills, you know, because they could probably pick up the avid skills, or I can show them the avid skills. Uh, I, I want to know that they're actually, um, you know, engaged and and enthusiastic and 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 love film or TV or or, or whatever. Anybody else about about that topic? Otherwise, I'd love to talk. Um, this is even, uh, I saw somebody ask about editors need reels. And there's very few people probably that came up through film. There's a couple that start as editors, right? You almost always start post PA or like runner, post PA, second assistant, first assistant. That's normally the way it works out. Assistants don't really need reels, right? And does anybody on the panel disagree with that? If you're an assistant, do you need a reel? I would say no. Yes. What uh, I what Eric? I no what I just want to say briefly. What I would say about that is, if you're an assistant editor and you're working as an editor and you're looking to again work um, and get in the chair, I think that it's helpful for you to have some type of representation of the work that you've been doing that you can share. As you know, um, I mean, often I'll get a call. Um, about a project, not often, but occasionally I'll get a call and somebody's looking for an editor. And generally what I like to try to do is, is to start to promote the people that have worked with me that I know are starting to move into the chair and starting to try to get more projects and build their body of work. And so I think it's helpful to be able to share what you're doing with the other people that you're working with, with the editors that you've worked with. As far as getting the job, um, you know, of course, it's uh, it's it's absolutely not necessary to me. But I, I feel like it's also great to know that there are projects that you're working on, there are things that you want to share. It may not be the first thing you want to do going into a, a you know an interview, but it's nice to have something like that so that as you build your relationship with your editor, it's something that you can start sharing about who you are and what 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 things you've been working on. And so I think as much as you can continue to work on the craft as you are still servicing a film um, and working with editors, it doesn't hurt. But I mean, I don't see it as, as a, I'm not expecting when you come in to interview with me that you're gonna hand me a reel of your work. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going to be looking at, yeah, how you're communicating. Um, uh, yes, I wanna see of course the work you've done and the people you've worked with and, and um, but, and, and I wanna hear how you talk about different things other than just the job. I think that Simon's absolutely right. I mean, we spend so much time together in that editing room. And it's important to know who you are as a person because that's really, um, that's going to be so much of, of how we are going to be existing and working together in a space. Um, somebody asked, um, can, can we, Unmute Matthew Morris. He asked about uh, transitioning is a little bit almost off topic, but transitioning to being a film director and how much being a, uh, in post is uh, an important kind of maybe way to get into that. Matthew, could you uh, talk to us about what your question is? Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for uh, meeting me. Um, so I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, this notion. So I'm originally from Belize and I moved up to the States to uh, work in film. I love filmmaking. And um, what I noticed when I was in my college years, I went to UCI, was that a lot of more modern directors, they have a lot of background in post. So 
I guess you could say David Fincher, I think uh, Paul, he's worked on some of his films, the episodes on intimate knowledge of Post. And uh, I think you're seeing like a lot more directors these days have a lot more hand in deeper aspects of production. So like Alfonso, he shot his own movie and everything. So I was always wondering, because I know many people here have worked on so many great projects, but they are editors and editors are very important. But I was wondering if it's important to actually push for a deep career in Post or should I just go ahead with the route that is the traditional film, you know, make your films, put in film festivals? Because these days being an editor, or at least being an editor at the premiere level, you have to know so much. You know, you have to understand color grading, you have to understand sound design, uh, you know, everything. Uh, which is a little bit different from people who are a little bit older, who are working at the higher level as an editor. They have different departments that deal with that. But if you're someone who works at corporate or even for content on YouTube, you know, you're expected to kind of be like an in-house production alone. So I was just wondering if, you know, you could just move forward and just decide to make your own stuff. You know? I, I answered his question on, on the chat, I think. Did I? It was your question, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, I probably you. gave a really... It, it, I basically answered it very, very quickly and, and it was, it sounded kind of glib, but I didn't mean it like that. I actually meant it very heartfelt. And I think I said something like, whatever your passion is, that's going to, that's going to help you. So if you are really, really into editing and want to move it to a director, that's great because what it's going to do, it's going to help you with your shot selection. And once you're a director and it's going to help you understand how to tell a story efficiently and it's going to help you see what the things that are you're missing, you know, uh, all of those things. If you're really into sound design, then as you're directing your project, then you are going to hear it in your head and you're going to be able to tell your editor, this is what I want. I don't want it to sound like a shootout. I want it to sound like it's, you know, almost everything is underwater because it's very internal. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just riffing, but all well, um... of those Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, because that's something I've noticed with a lot of editors where they were talk about working with directors and they're a little bit frustrated because the director themselves may or may not know the, the, the language that they're working with. But uh, as someone who would come from post, they would understand everything about how to make visual effects easier for the visual effects department. Uh, with sound, they would understand everything about how they want to do whatever, yeah. You are, I mean, there are those consummate filmmakers out there now. Um, uh, 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 Guillermo del Toro does that. Alfa, you know, all those guys, you know, Poron does that. And I'm just, I'm thinking out, on, out of my, you know, just uh, off the top of my head. But, you know, again, that's why I, when I answered your question, it was like, look, whatever your passion is, you're going to use those skills. Um, but I will say this, here's another thing that you have to consider um, because yes, not newer, the, you know, younger filmmakers are having to do more and they're, you know, taking more control of their projects, which is a good thing um, because the more uh, you can do, the more control you have. But you also have to remember if you're trying to get, you know, one of these really big editors or something to work with you, you have to remember that there's a reason that I may want to work with you. And if you're too much of a control freak, you know, you, it, 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 it's like, I, I like to tell friends of mine, you know, especially interviews, like dating. It's like, look, there, this is a two-way relationship, you know, or a multi-collaboration. And if it comes down to, wow, I really love what you did on Breaking Bad, but I want total control. It's like, well, hey man, maybe you should hire somebody else or do it yourself. You know, and I don't mean that in a mean way. I just mean that you have to understand, like, if I wanted Roger Deakins, but I was going to tell Roger Deakins what I was going to do, he probably wouldn't take the job. Um, can... You're muted, Steve. You're muted, Steve. Thank you. Um, I'm back. Uh, Somebody had an interesting question. Can you let Chris Boyd into the chat? Chris Boyd asked about the mentor-mentee relationship. Chris, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I was actually just asking on behalf of somebody who asked early in the chat. His name is Tyson. Hey, what's up? 
Yeah, yeah, that's him. Hey, so um, let's see, how do I articulate this? Um, is there like a good way to make a lot of the the things that we've, you know, the work that mentees do to like, you know, connect with editors and stuff, and the way mentors work to um, that want to take in people? Is there a way to standardize some of those things? Um, because there's a, there's a lot of groups that are doing um, some of this work with like internships, like ACE and TV Academy um, or the diversity programs. Um, is there a way to build that up and make it um, a consideration for um, like post, you know, post teams when they're first building them? Like um, having a, building up the associate editor position and making that um, like an intermediator, intermediator between first in AE and where it's like, this is your job is to learn from your editor. And, you know, cause everybody's just busy um, doing their things when they're on things that are supposed to be, you know, learning from in theory, like post BAs and AEs. So I was just wondering if you can expand on that kind of thing. Before I let anybody else answer this, I wanted to point out that um, I just started getting emails. Uh, Katie Hinson is, um, runs a group called Blue Collar Post Collective. Mm -hmm. And it's in New York, it's in LA, you can go on Facebook, there's a Facebook group for Blue Collar Post Collective. And she just started a an intern chat group, which is a Google um, database she's creating of people who are willing to be mentors, and people who are willing to be mentees, or wanting to be mentees, wanting to be mentored. And then she's connecting those people. So I just got my first email from somebody that wants me to be their mentor. So um, there, there's stuff like that. Does anybody else on the panel know of any way that people can connect with a mentor other than them being your, you know, first AE or something? Well, I kind of, um, I found one of my mentors uh, through a friend, basically, I, I did a lot of like IMDB searches and I kind of just like formed a really good relationship with them. Um, I took time to just get to know them. I, it was very just not typical. I, I feel like I, I just kind of, they became my mentor. I saw your credits, like, um, it was actually someone who worked with Terry before. And I was like, um, uh, and they kind of took me under their wing. Like I built a relationship and it was just kind of reciprocated in that sense. Like, I don't, I don't really know of any kind of standardized way. I don't think any of the mentors that I really have has kind of been, uh, have been as standardized, but I kind of just went out and saw what people were doing, the things that they were, uh, the projects that they were taking on and kind of the things that I would um, hear them say on panels and things like that. And I would take time to invest in a relationship with them. That's kind of how I went about getting mine. I think there's, I don't know any uh, specific mentor groups, but there is a lot of um, like Facebook groups for uh, black folks in post that have been popping up uh, lately or have been around for a minute. Uh, black in post, uh, actually I see somebody saying it on the chat, uh, Ujima. Um, I think if you, uh, it, it might be more of a, a, a thing that you got to reach out to people and, and ask, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know specific programs myself, but I think it, the way I've done it in the past has been people have reached out to me um, and, you know, we can kind of establish a relationship through that face-to-face -face time, like I think a lot of people have been talking about. And probably some of those Facebook groups are a good place to find uh, resources for that or some of those uh, websites. I think it's also good practice is like um, for advocating for yourself also, just getting out there and being able to articulate why you're interested in this person and why you're interested in spending more time hearing about their career and their goals and how they got to where they are. Um, Sedjo asked me pr privately, somebody that's on here about if anybody is working in animation. I don't think anybody here is an animation editor. It's a very specific, uh, specialized skill. 
that's not similar really to most of what any of us do. Um, anybody out there know of any, any of that, an animation editor? I mean, for me, I would think for those kind of things, it's, it's going online and seeing like, um, like uh, hair love, right? It, try to find some connection. If you can find a, a person of color that's doing animation, try to connect with them personally. I find a lot of my interviews through Art of the Cut. I'm just going on Twitter. I'm going to a YouTube video. I'm checking IMDb when I see a movie that I love. Hey, how can I reach this person? I find the assistant that, oh, Kelly Dixon once worked as the assistant editor for this guy. If I contact Kelly, maybe Kelly can get me his email, something like that. Like you just have to use whatever connections you can. The very first interview I ever got on Art of the Cut, I literally found the Twitter handle of somebody that I wanted to interview. And I just did it through Twitter. I mean, he didn't know who I was. I was, I'm nobody. <laughs> there's no reason for anybody to contact me. I realized there's some, I'm on a white privilege to that, that I, you know, I don't know what to say anything about, but um, I just contacted somebody through Twitter and they responded and they said they'd be willing to be interviewed. That's a way to make a connection. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be just post-production. I mean, like for instance, you know, Pete Ramsey has gotten a lot of attention from his uh, work on Spider-Man. And, you know, if, if you're not necessarily able to find that connection um, in editorial, you can still reach out to people that are involved in animation and say, I'm interested in editorial. Can you maybe direct me towards somebody who can help me um, learn more about that particular thing? Um, so again, there's not always that one way in which is what we've talked about. Yeah. Um, I, we've been at this for two and a half hours. I am, I love this discussion, but I also want to be respectful for the, to the panel. Does anybody, you know, do we, I don't know how to put this. Does anybody want to go home? Or are we all just loving having a great conversation? Well, with I mean, Simon, what are you at now? Are you, you're like at almost one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but um, no, like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I think for me, this is, this is great. Like I'm chuffed a bit so that this is taking place. So please, um, I'm, I'm really enjoying listening to this. I'm, I'm, I'm here as long as it, there are people able to be here. Did, did Roger drop off? Uh, Ro Roger did drop off, but you know, okay. like R Roger um, really, uh, you know, wanted to, to, put his hand up when all of the Twitter storm kicked off and, and just show to people, I guess like I did as well, that, um, uh, that there's, that there's allies, you know, there are, there are definitely white editors uh, who, who don't agree with, um, you know, the, the racist comments that were being made who, um, don't agree with the, the situation as it is at the moment that want to, to see change. So, um, someone like Roger, who's, you know, the guy cut, Titanic and, <laughs> and Star Wars, well, well, the Caribbean and, you know, so um, that, that meant a lot even for me to see, to see him say that he, he was on here earlier. So, um, Carrie, well, we got Roger back I, on side. Yeah. What I would also say about Roger is the first time I met Roger was when I was an assistant editor and I was working with a, um, one of the editors that I worked with for years, Howard Smith. And what I remember about Roger was when we were transitioning from film to Avid, um, which again, most of you weren't born yet, but <laughs> when we were doing that, you know, the thing about Roger is Roger got in there from a technical standpoint and Roger was the person that when we had questions, when we had technical questions about this, this new software that we were trying to figure out and I was lucky to have an editor who was like, we're going to learn this together. And I, you know, did things on my, on the side to try to get better than he was and learn it better than he did so that I could truly be a informed assistant. But there are times when we were both kind of like, oh my gosh, whatever. And Roger was one of those young up and coming people who had a, had a skill set that was helpful to us. And I say this to say that, you know, and, and Roger's career took off and so it, it is good to have those tools, you know, as technology is changing and we're getting new software and we're getting all types of new toys to play with. Um, now that we're in COVID and we're dealing with now, how are we going to communicate as editors 
you know, remotely if we have to. This is new technology that is, is people are trying to figure out. And I think it's important to just, again, try to, um, you know, learn as much as you can. And, and, and so that you do have some skill set that, that, um, makes you, that makes you stand out. Yeah, two things I'll, I'll toss in. Um, um, I'm down to keep talking because uh, I feel like we have this period. I, it's an opportunity to get kind of a little bit more real. Like, you know, I encourage people just like, just ask those questions. Um, so I'm down to, you know, be a part of that, help facilitate it. And then two, um, talking more about Roger. Um, yeah, I know he absolutely, well, I feel he is absolutely somebody who would, uh, who, who wanted to be here and for whatever reason, um, you know, couldn't be here for the whole thing. Uh, uh, you know, in, in exchanges that I've had with Roger and uh, being able to um, be with him for, for a period of time, um, assisting him for a period of time, he, he's a, a fantastic soul, um, just a, a really, really great human being. Um, so I'm sure if he could have been here, uh, he would have been, so. I'm curious, um, mostly from Brady. Um, can I call you Brady? Brady? It's Brady, right? Brady. Braden. Okay. Is it? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Braden. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm curious because I, I just want to know: it, was there any more to that? You know, Twitter ridiculous crap. You know, because I, I mean, it was like, look, I, I caught up on the on the screenshots of all that, and. I was pretty horrified and I know a lot of people, like I know a lot of people, but I was so glad that I didn't know any of those people. And, you know, it's like, the thing is, I mean, like the other day, Monday, I think I was filling out my Emmy ballot. And what I noticed is I don't really, I didn't really know hardly anybody on that whole thing. Like I was really, I mean, like, I was like, have I been out of the loop for that long or, have there just been such an influx of product that they're moving up assistants and moving up editors like crazy? Because I knew where I used to know at least maybe 50%, 60% of the editors on there, this time I knew maybe like 10 to 20% of the editors on there. And I guess my point is, is it really that, and, you know, I'll ask this of the white guys, is it really that they're so afraid of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, a handful of black, because there's a lot of, a lot of work out there. I mean, it's got, it's nuts to think that white editors, white male editors are this afraid that they're not going to work. I mean, that it's crazy to me. Yeah, I, I agree. It is crazy. And, you know, I think, it's, I think it's symptomatic of a bunch of things. I mean, I think there were some of them who were just, uh, just racist. Um, I think a lot more of them were fearful. Uh, and I think part of that comes from uh, this particular moment in time that we're in, that's a reckoning for so many people um, to look at what's going on around them and look at their own behaviors. And a lot of people don't, care to investigate themselves. And I think uh, a lot of that fear is unfounded, right? I mean, it, it's not all, it, I think the last numbers I saw, it was well over 90% uh, of editors are white, uh, white men and women, and, uh, and mostly men. And so it's not like there's going to be some sudden shift where they all lose their jobs and we come rushing in. Uh, but I think this fear uh, that exists because, okay, somebody said 92%. Uh, this, this fear that, um, I don't know, it's kind of like an unknown time right now because people are getting called out on their shit, frankly. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of these editors, they just, they've never been confronted with uh, the possibility that for even one job, they would not be the default choice. And I think it's it's that challenge to the default uh, that that makes them uh, feel 
they're not really, but it makes them feel like they're oppressed. And I think they were speaking out on it for that reason. But in reality, no, it's, it's not going to change overnight because of a post. It, it, but we can do the work to uh, bring some sort of, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I want to say equality, but we got to even this out a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, think, I would hope you'd say equality. <laughs> well, well, but, you know, we're not going to get to a place, I don't think. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we're going to get to a place where it's just necessarily not representative. Yeah. Yeah. I think and, and, it has like, more so to do with, like, though, you being told, like, no, you're not going to, like, this is being only, this position right here is we are looking for people who look like this. And it's being told that like you don't have access to this opportunity when you've right. had access to every opportunity. So, right. you know what I mean? Like it's more so of just like it being about you not getting that one, you know? Like, wow, yeah, like, I mean, I'm not gonna have that. I think we've all probably, as black editors, uh, you know, a lot of times, I, well, I'll just speak for myself. I'll get put on black projects, which is great and all, but, um, I've never seen an issue with white editors cutting black content, but it doesn't seem like it always goes the other way around. They get, and I'm sure even Terry probably ran into this doing the old guard um, that, uh, and, and others have run into, I mean, Kelly, I don't know if you ran into it on Breaking Bad, but uh, I think that I've seen that white producers or producers in general get nervous about cutting you know, white content or mainstream content, uh, and they and they kind of like to put us in a little box, and it, it doesn't go the other way. I gotta say, I am very very fortunate that I did not get, I did not have that kind of treatment, cutting Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul. You know, I mean, you know, I I I cut the pot. I I was working on the pilot with the editor of Breaking Bad, and I happened to cut the drug making montage and one other scene. But I think what really got me through was that editor advocating for me saying I was ready. And I put in the work to talk to that director and that producer just to, you know, let them know who I was. I, I, I mean, I don't know, but I want to believe that that was really what gave me that job. And again, in addition to that editor advocating for me, right? Um, but, you know, it's, it just shocks me because we, it's not that we haven't seen this kind of thing before, you know, a few years ago when everybody only wanted women directors, white male directors had absolute fits, you right. know, and I'm like going, look, how, how many, you know, women directors are out there and how many projects are there? You know, it's like, come on, you know, why on earth are you guys so afraid? You know, the other thing that I will mention too is that it's not only, and this, this I think, um, forgive me if I'm being presumptuous, but it's not, this happens I think more in the feature, you know, aspect rather than the TV aspect. And I'm talking scripted only, but it's more hiring editors is not only the director and the producers, you know, the studio has a whole hell of a lot to do with, you know, whether that editor is going to get that job. And I, you know, I don't want to mention who it is, but I know that I was talking to a friend of mine who was cutting a movie last year, a black editor, um, and you can probably figure it out from the amount of black editors there, but I mean, you know, it was basically the studio was suggesting down the list, oh, how about this person, that person, that person, none of them black. And apparently the director had to say, hey, why aren't you giving me any black editors? And she had to advocate. But honestly, the studio was the one that had to be won over. Now, Paul, Terry, y'all work, you know, more you know, feature projects, I've got one, but that's it, you know? So, I mean, I'm curious, is that still the case or, 
you know, I mean, it just seems to me that the studio has a whole lot more to deal with, to do with it. And they want to call, you know, all the white guys to do it. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of film it is. Curious. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it has been, again, I'm not going to get into my career challenges. I mean, uh, you know, get into the mice of it. You can look at my body of work. You can see what I've worked on. You can see the directors that I've worked with and the directors I've worked on with repeatedly. And at the same time, when I'm not working with those directors and I want to, as any artist, broaden my spectrum, try different things. Um, you know, I can, my own, you know, my ability to get a job, um, get that opportunity, I only have a certain degree of control over. Um, you know, uh, it, it's one thing to want to do something different. Let's say I wanted to cut a Harry Potter, wanted to cut, you know, whatever that is. Um, if I can't get a meeting uh, to even, if I can't even get myself into the room to, uh, you know, audition, so to speak, then there's all, you know, there, there are different types of firewalls, right? And so, you know, you like to think that as you continue to build your resume, that that gets easier. Um, in rare cases, it does. Uh, but I also find myself constantly having to, um, again, educate people as to why I should be considered for the opportunity, uh, depending on the project. I mean, on one hand, there are going to be people who are making these decisions that are going to want to go with somebody with a statue. They're going to want to go with somebody who's done it before. That's, you know, they, they want to go to a safe space. Um, whether it's because I look like the whether I or what I've done before. I mean, it can be any number of reasons. When I first started my career, my name was Carolyn A. Shropshire, um, and we didn't have, a, you know, Google and all these things. It was always kind of fun to go into an interview because they didn't really know who that who, you know, when I walked through the door, they weren't expecting someone named Carolyn A. Shropshire to look like me. So there was always that kind of moment where it was kind of fun for me, like, oh, you know, you could see their eyes shift a little bit. That, of course, doesn't happen anymore because you can just Google and see what I look like. But um, I say this to say that, you know, um, I've been doing this for a while. I've been working with Gina prince Whitewood for 20 years. Our first film was Love and Basketball. We've done six, thing six films together and a number of other things. And um, so when she called me and said, I'm doing this project called The Old Guard, and, uh, and, and to her credit, when she went in for the meeting, she says, there are two people I have to have, you know, and I was one of them. But that didn't even, but I, that didn't mean that I didn't have to still go into um, a meeting at the Netflix with 20 other people across the, you know, other side of the table and explain and talk to them as to why I should be the one editing the old guard. It wasn't like I suddenly just got a call from my agent saying, okay, you got the gig. So, you know, and I could get angry about it, but that doesn't serve anybody. That doesn't serve me um, get, you know, getting the job that I, I want to do. And so I think in some ways, yes, it's frustrating. And I, I used to joke where I look forward to the day when I'm at a point in my career, like a Dee Dee Allen or an Ann Coates where I'm revered, where when I say something, people lean in and go, oh, she said that. But, you know, I, I also know that whatever I do next, I'll probably still have to go into a room. And, and, and it's not for me, it's for them to understand who I am. That's why I say to you, it's like, you can't assume that people you know, know who you are, even after I've done the old guard. Yeah, they've seen I could do the old guard. But if, if, if it's necessary for me to go in a room and, and explain to somebody one more time why I should be the one to get the, to do a project, you can be damn sure I'm going to do that. Because if it's something I care about, you know, I'm not going to expect them to necessarily, you know, I'd like it to happen. I'd like not to have to do that. But if that's what I have to do, that's what I will, will, will have to do to get the, the gig. But you know, part of that is I earned that because of my relationship with the directors that I've worked with before. And, um, 
do I think that if I had gone into the old guard and Gina had not been the director and, and I would have gotten that call to cut that movie based on um, what the, how they see my body of work, not how I see my body of work. My body of work shows every genre imaginable, right? Comedies, dramas, action. It was all there, but it's under that umbrella of black film or working with a black director, right? But at the same time, you know, everything that I've done has prepared me for what's next. And I know that sounds like a mantra, but that has been my journey. Everything I do, the easy ones, the hard ones, everything has prepared me for what I just finished. And Old Guard will prepare me in some ways to what I do next. And that's part of the craft. So yeah, it's, it's not, it's, um, it's hard and it doesn't get easy. It gets easier, but I can't say that it's gotten easy. And I can't, I can't say that, oh, now that I've done the old guard, I'm just you know, suddenly gonna be able to do whatever I wanna do. I'm gonna still continue to have to fight for the things that I care about. Hopefully it will get easier, but I think it's, you know, I keep, it's, it's like I'm a walking cliche. I mean, editing is not for the faint of heart. And certainly, um, you know, I am an editor, I'm an artist that's wrapped up in this package of a woman and being a black woman, all things I'm incredibly proud of. And I bring my lens to everything that I do as a storyteller. And, um, you know, and I'm going to keep trying to do this, what I'm doing, but, you know, yes, I mean, Kelly, to answer your question in a very long-winded way, is um, it's hard. It's been hard. And um, I hope that it'll get easier. And I'm hoping that what I'm doing is going to be make it easier for those people who are, are, are coming up. I, I don't like to say behind me, but uh, beside me, you know, um, in this. Paul, did you want to speak into that? I was just going to say, just uh, as far as what Kelly was saying, like more specifically, yeah, the studio is has a lot of say in, in who the editor is. Um, just, you know, observation, not that I've been a part of like those conversations, but when I've been on jobs, you know, the, the editors who've had it uh, versus the editors who've been challenged. Um, like the editors who have like an easy time or whatever, um, they're like a part of almost like a rotation of like five people that studios think of. And they're like, oh yeah, well, can't we get such and such? Well, is such and such available? And then such and such, and once they get past like that one hand of people, um, it appears they're, they're at a loss. And they're like, well, nobody can cut it then. And you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, but that's, that's how the studio works. I mean, the thing to remember is it's, it's still a business. And they're like, look, we, we want to get like, our return. So they're playing it very conservative. You know, uh, many of us here, we're, we're creative people. And we're like, we can do that. You know, it may not be like, I don't know, Paul Rubel, but you know what? I have a different eye. Just like Terry was saying, like, you know, I have the lens that, you know, that she, she has a lens that she works through, right? And it's no less valid than anybody else. Um, but it's hard for the studios, uh, in my, you know, experience to see that. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I'm so glad that, I mean, Terry, I don't know, can you hear me? Um, I'm glad that Terry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. I just figured that you and Paul, you know, have the feature experience. And I've noticed that the jobs that I tend to go, tend to get calls for in television are really kind of like showrunner, you know, not so much director, showrunner. Um, and based on that, I think they just kind of you know, tell the studio, but on studio, on features, man, it's, it's like, it's a lot. So I was, um, that's what I was kind of looking for to, if, if that was still the case. Um, but I gotta say that, you know, when I, I've done one feature and honestly, I left Better Call Saul and everybody thought I was crazy, but I was like, look, it's time to move on. I can't do this, you know, for the rest of my career. I need to do other things. And when I, you know, was trying to get a feature, it took me a couple of years and I was really, really, um, I was very, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just, I, I read a lot of scripts, <laughs> you know, that I just didn't want to 
just, you know, I was like, first of all, I cared about the money. Even I was like, look, I'm not going to work for less than I'm working in TV. I can't afford it. Um, and I also said, look, I don't want to do a horror movie in my garage. No, nothing against horror movies, but I was like, that's not what I want to do. So I was really very particular. Um, but when I, you know, got the goldfinch, um, I, I didn't expect it. It came out of nowhere and I was really surprised. And from what I understand, I was probably like the, you know, in the 20th editor that they talked to. I don't know why I got that job. Well, I mean, I want to think that I got that job basically because I connected with the director. But as far as my resume, I think the studio was like, whoa, no, I knew, you know, because they're, you know, and I'm saying this to everybody else because, you know, there's a lot of people here that are looking to move from reality to scripted or I'm seeing, you know, questions. How do I move from this to that? And I'm like, look, even if you have a resume, it's very, very hard. It is hard to change your stripes. Um, you can do it, but it's, it's pretty hard. And it's not, it, there's a lot of people who have to be lined up in your corner to actually get it, not just the director, not just the, you know. So, you know, in, in TV is a little bit different. Um, features is a lot harder. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I want to, I, I'm, I hope you guys will keep talking, but uh, I haven't seen my parents in two and a half years and I'm here at my parents' home in New York. So I want to go uh, socialize with them, but I want to talk about a couple of things before I, I go. One is there've been a lot of creative questions and this was kind of set up as, as getting into having uh, black cult, uh, filmmakers get into this business and see post as a, as a, as a path which is I think what we've been talking about tonight. And I would love, hopefully Simon and Braden and Kelly, and we can all have another discussion about all the, the creative questions um, that people are asking. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about Kelly that, um, that I really wanted to give as a hopeful point to people is there's been talk about, hey, the skills that you need to have, and you might think, oh, I don't have great avid skills. It's an expensive program, I can't do that. There are plenty of skills that you can have. And the reason why I wanted to reference Kelly is because she said she connected with the director. She didn't direct, she didn't connect with the director because of her blackness. She connected with the director because of a specific personal thing about her that was similar to the character in the movie, correct, Kelly? Uh, actually, we were talking a lot about the X-Files and I was kind of being a little annoying asking, how did you do this? <laughs> But, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's usually something that's not really about the product that we're working on. It's usually about something in their past. Oh, one other thing that we did connect on, which was a documentary that we had both seen about Jonestown. And because that is so, it was so harrowing and such a, a very deep experience, I think we both sort of you know, kind of got an affinity for, you know, each other, just connecting through something so emotional. Yeah. But you also mentioned, I think, in the interview that we did, and it might not have been part of your interview with the director, but that it was your connection about this boy that was kind of displaced in this oh, the family. Goldfinch. Oh, goldfinch. I thought, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, no. I thought you meant um, Breaking Bad. Yeah, no, um, the Goldfinch, definitely. It was, uh, it was about a kid who had lost his mother in a tragic, you know, uh, terrorist accident or, you know, terrorist bombing. And I lost my mother very early, not in a terrorist bombing, but very suddenly. And I really, really connected to the material in a way. And I, you know, honestly, really, it was crazy that they were even interviewing me because, you know, I was looking for hopefully a $5 million movie and this was a $50 million movie and there was no way in hell I even told my agent, there's no way they're going to give me this feature. So I kind of read the script and went into that interview with nothing to lose. I'm like, look, I'm going to tell you honestly how I feel about this and how, you know, what this story means to me and what I see. Here's how I see this character. And I think that that had a, a lot to do with why I got the project. Right. And but the, my reason why I wanted to bring that up is because there are so many people on this call that may feel like, uh, I, I don't know, there's a skill or a connection to a person that I might not have. Maybe it's uh, a white director. How am I going to, you know, whatever it is. 
there are these other parts of your personality and there are other skills. Like somebody mentioned, oh, you got to be good at Avid. Maybe you're great at music. Maybe you're a great assistant editor who can find the perfect piece of music for your editor. That's a huge skill to have, just knowing music well or being able to edit music or like uh, Braden mentioned, he was good at After Effects. After Effects people are worth their weight in gold to many editors. Um, so there are all these skills that make you valuable that you don't necessarily like for, for personal things like Kelly, you know, she lost her mother at an early age and she gets this film opportunity about a character that loses his mother at an early age and she can relate and that means a lot. Um, any, uh, what, uh, you know, I'm gonna leave you guys in the capable ha hands of either Braden or Simon here and bow out, but um, I hope we get a chance to uh, have more of these discussions and some of the creative questions, um, please, uh, if, you, if you get a chance, a lot of these creative questions we talk about on Art of the Cut, with people like Kelly and um, Terry, I hope we can have you on Art of the Cut sometime soon. I would love that opportunity. Oh, thank you. Of course, that would be lovely. Thank you. I would love that. Okay, we're gonna get it arranged. You guys have a great time. Okay. I'm gonna go say hi to my parents and have some dinner. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that everyone uh, does know who Steve Holfish is, but like I've been listening to his podcast and reading his interviews for, for years. Um, I read Ke Kelly's one uh, uh, on there and, and, you know, you should all definitely go and look at his, his stuff after this. Um, c c should we bring in a few more people like uh, who, who have been sitting here asking questions and, and get them to ask them the, themselves? Um, Caitlin Lowe, can you join us? You've, you've, I've seen that you've asked loads of great questions in the chat. Um, the last one you just said about black centric shows. Do you want to, do you want to join us and, and ask that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I've grown up in predominantly black spaces. So that kind of drives a lot of the things that I, uh, care about and want to work with. But I, I noticed that some people feel kind of caged in where it's like they're working on specifically black things. And while I don't personally think it's an issue, I know that I'm not super far in my career. So I was just wondering if like people who were uh, at a level that I'd want to be at feel like it could be a problem for them or like they uh, are boxed in by people who they could possibly work with instead of feeling that, that cage themselves. Um, I want to, I'll speak a little bit on this because, you know, I am incredibly proud of the films I've worked on and the directors that I work with. And um, I would not be here today if it wasn't for Casey Levins and, and Gina Prince Bythewood and Reggie Bythewood and Ava DuVernay and the, the, these amazing directors who have seen me and given me the opportunity to showcase my talent. And they're incredible storytellers that are saying, telling incredibly significant parts of who we are as black people. And so that is everything to me with respect to those relationships. And then they stop and they take time to rewrite and work and, and, and pursue, you know, prepare for whatever's next. And as an editor and, and as an audience member, I'm watching everything like in television and movies. And I mean, I grew up watching everything, black, all types of films. And so my, my, my space is, I always want to be available to those directors, right, to tell their stories. And at the same time, when they're not telling their stories, I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. I want to be able to do the films that I enjoy watching and the TV shows I enjoy watching. Um, and that's where, you know, it's not so much, a, it's like not a hindrance or it's not, it's, it's, it's what feeds my soul when I'm working. And at the same time, I want to be able to, you know, th there are other directors too of, of different types of races and, 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 and genders that, that inspire me and their work inspires me. And, you know, I'd like to be able to have that option to explore that, that part of my storytelling. Um, so I, I think that there's nothing, yes, of, of course, you should be incredibly excited and proud to 
be someone who wants to facilitate the vision of black directors, of, a, of all directors, but it's specifically that's what you want to do and that's what you're late, what you, what you want to focus on, then you go for that and you, you tell those, you be part of the stories that you want to see and reflect on this earth. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to jump in on that? I mean, because like what I found um, really um, exciting about the panel, uh, you know, and the, and the people that agreed to do this is we've got people who are working on black centric shows or worked on black centric shows. You know, Daisha's worked on Black Lady Sketch Show and Insecure and so on. But then you've got also Kelly Dixon's working on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul which are not seen as, as black centric shows in, in any way. Paul Alderman's working on the Avengers and so on. So does anyone else want to kind of jump in on that on, on, or yeah, on how you, how you look at it? Uh, I'll just, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll defer. <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry. I had to no. step out for a second. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I personally don't see it as, black centric shows um you know i see it as the next project um because many times like many of us you know we're working professionals and you know we want to keep the lights on <laughs> so you know you just yeah i, I don't look at it like uh black shows or, or, or white shows i mean they're the things that i'm interested in like like me personally um you know, I like action, monsters, sci-fi, fantasy stuff. Um, so, you know, if I can, you know, float in those areas or if I get, you know, off of those, those jobs, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them. Um, and, you know, I always think about things that, you know, that interest me. Um, so I, I say don't get so, let's see, how do, how do I word this? Every movie is the same. Uh, I think somebody said earlier, like uh, the process is the same one, whether it's a $5 million movie or a $10 million movie. You can be doing a black exploitation movie from the 70s, and I guarantee you, like people who worked on that have something to offer the process making movies now on the, the biggest project. Like they're, they're all doing the same process um, as far as going between them. Um, if you're just cold at your, your, your area of the craft. Um, like I always pat myself up and I even tell other people, I'm just like, I, I'm coming in and I'm coming in confident. I'm like, look, you're not going to find anybody better than me. Right. And I think people are, are drawn to that because they're like, okay, this person will take care of the project. And that's all people really want to hear. Like the responsibility that you're being given, um, you can manage it and that you can handle it and they don't have to worry about that. People, producers, directors, studio, they love when they can not worry about it. They like, oh, that, I know that name or that's so-and-so, he got it. Um, so if you're working on black projects, that, that comes across uh, the same way it does on something like The Avengers or working on a David Fincher project, you know? So I always say, just be cold at what you do. Right. Yeah, yeah. Can I, I was going to say something about that to you. Um, I'm sorry. No, go, Desha. I was just going to say that that's who gets the job, is the one they don't have to worry about. They don't want to have to worry about the fact that they said yes to you and then work stress. They want to, like, hire you and forget about you and yep. just know that you're going to deliver and make them look good. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dave. No, yeah, that's 100% true. I, I remember I interviewed once, and I got the job. It was for a pilot, um, and I got the job. And then later, that editor told me I got the job because out of the 15 people he interviewed, I was the only one that, when asked if I could use After Effects, I, with no hesitation, said, yeah, absolutely. Like, just 100%, obviously, I can. And he said everyone else is a little bit more hesitant or like not sure of themselves in their, in their answer. Um, and they might have, they might have known how to use it, but they just didn't present that way. So 
I 100% agree with that. Um, but as far as working on uh, all things black, um, I I love it. I'm I'm like I I think I, I answered some of this in the chat, but I do think that you know you know the the media tends to not pay as much attention to the shows that I work on, maybe besides Insecure. Um, but that doesn't feel like a hindrance to me because I think that I, I feel so validated in, in what I do. And it is because I'm personally drawn to the material. Um, Insecure was definitely something that felt like just me and my friends uh, trying to navigate this life, trying to navigate the situation. So of course I was obsessed with working on something like that. Um, like I said in the chat, 20s, you know, not everyone knows about 20s, but the black queer women that message me all the time or message Lena all the time, or like, you know, the directors of the show um, and say how much that show means to them makes it so much more worthwhile. And at the end of the day, I don't really, you know, care who's watching it. You know, that that's way more uh, important uh, to me. And while technically all of the shows are the same, I used to work on a show called 911. And it was amazing because in, you know, one episode, I could be cutting a comedy scene, a action scene, uh, something that was really tense, something that was really emotional, and it's all in one episode. So you get to like flex a little bit, you know, um, but that audience was so different that the music I chose was different. Um, the way it was cut was just very different. Like there's just, there's some things about it that are different, but cutting a sketch comedy show felt very different than cutting uh, Insecure, you know? It's, it's the, the process was a little bit different. So I still find challenge in it. I don't think that there's anything lacking or I'm missing out on anything. There's a thousand things I want to do in my career. Um, I want to, like she said, brought up, it would have been dope to, you know, cut Harry Potter. It would have been dope to like, to, you know, do something like the old guard would be amazing. Like, um, I love action films and anything with like a, a woman at the center is like, it's phenomenal. And I think that there's all these things that I want to do, but I don't feel like, building my resume with material that I'm passionate about will stop me from that. I think that it just is up to me to make sure that I get out there and get in front of the, the right people to get where I want to go. Yeah, I, w I would agree with um, that. I don't really have any black centric, uh, I guess, shows anywhere on my resume, but um, you know, I still, every project I've ever chosen, ever chosen, I have really loved something about it. Um, like really love something about it. And that's extremely important to me, whatever I work on, because I know how much, how, how hard I go every single day. So it has to be with material that I feel connected to. Um, and, you know, I try to work with people who I, love to work with but um those two things are extremely important to me at the end of the day more than anything else cool should we jump uh on another question uh chris boyd you'd asked um some questions about uh locations and stuff like that do you want to join us and and put questions to the panel yeah um i live in a smaller city nowhere near new york Really. I'm actually in Canada and so Toronto is like the big city here and I just want to know how connected uh, the film and TV world is to Toronto, Canada as a whole or do I have to do I have to make that move to New York, LA to start working in film and TV? Canada's thriving. Yeah. Especially yeah. now there's no COVID in Canada. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, there's like, you know, they're trying to get back into production. Yeah. From what I understand, Canada's, and can't go there. They've built a wall against Americans, so, you know. But it's, but I mean, it's post-production in Canada. But right? also, you know, 
It used to be. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't worked there recently, but I, when I was on Talk to Me, I was in I was in Toronto, and you know, often when you're going on location, they may let you bring one assistant. Well, again, it depends on the budget, right? But usually, they they let you maybe bring your first assistant, right, or certain key crew members, and then you know, we ultimately have to find the right people to to build our post team if we're on location. And so um, I think that you're actually in a, I mean, I think other people, people can talk about this more than I can, but I think you're in a great place, frankly. I think the hard part about the situation now, as far as COVID, and if you don't have a resume and if you don't know anybody, and I hate to be like this, but it is kind of rough, is that, you know, it goes back to people are gonna hire who they know or people that or people of people who are one degree or two degrees from people they know because at this point everybody's working at home everybody's working remotely so it's harder to break into that kind of group i mean i'm you know working right now but you know a lot of the studio heads that i'm working with i've literally never met um, and it makes it hard because I'm on calls with them, but they don't know me and I don't know them. So it makes it very hard to read the room. It makes it very hard to understand because unless you're on a video call, there's, you know, facial expressions or, you know, sometimes it's like, wow, is this a meeting that they want me to talk in or should I just not talk? And it's very, very difficult. I'm not going to lie that I think COVID is and working remotely is going to be a little tougher if you're not already established now you guys if you have other opinions i'd love to hear them because that's kind of the way that i'm sort of interpreting the situation but as far as Canada goes there's a lot of i think that toronto is thriving you know as far as film goes i would say in terms of covid uh the the most interesting thing that's happening for me is I, i'm like I'm meeting with people almost every day with, with, you know, uh, execs and everybody like over zoom. It, it's so easy now. And if you, if you can uh, kind of use this moment to, to seize and to get in front of people so they can see your face. And I mean, uh, a lot of them are still working on things, but they got some time for meetings. Uh, and if you force your way in the door and say, I'm interested in this, like a lot of these meetings, I'm not looking for a job. I just want you to meet me. I want to meet you. And I want you to, to have me in mind for when we talk later on down the line in the future or to get some feedback from you. Or maybe I could offer some feedback to you. But I, I think now is a really good time, uh, more than any time that I've experienced before to say, hey, can I get this meeting? I'd love to get a Zoom with you next week. Uh, when can we set that up? And, and it'll usually happen. Or, you know, you'll, you'll at least talk to somebody and, and that's important. That's good. Yeah. You'd be amazed what can come from those small meetings too. Um, you yeah. know, I always figure like those small meetings just kind of get to know somebody or talk frankly. Um, and, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll, they'll remember that. Um, like Roger gave me an opportunity, Roger Barton who couldn't be on, um, I was connected with him just because I had questions about, you know, managing things outside the industry when you're being a part of the industry. And he had like some specific knowledge about it. And, uh, you know, we just, we just chatted about that for real. And then, you know, he hit me back, was like, hey, you know, let, let's talk about, you know, something I got coming up. Um, so yeah, try to network, uh, you know, have those small meetings, like this COVID situation right now if you got any kind of connection that can put you, you know, in with some people to just chat, you know, you know, have a question in mind, um, something specific that you, you, you want to know about, you know, and be genuine about it. Like, Hey, I'm not looking for anything, but I'm really curious about this. Uh, people are, people are answering questions. Yes. Cool. Um, it is actually a uh, quarter to two in the morning here in, in England. <laughs> so I should really, and also I've kept all of um, these panelists far longer than I uh, originally pitched and said that I would. So I should uh, 
maybe wrap things up a little bit. Um, can we go around like the 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 panelists here and just maybe give some final thought and then and then say goodbye and log off if I just like throw it to us one at a time. Um, Terry, do you want to start? Do you want to, to give us a, a final thing to take away? Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I know that a lot, there's, there's a lot to, more to discuss. And I know that at times it can be incredibly frustrating. And um, I always uh, tend to think of the mantra that Gina walks her walk by, which is overcome the no. And um, you're going to, in this business, you're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of impedance. And I just think that um, there's a marathon to being an editor. Um, there are, you know, we're not going to have meteoric rises and, meteor, you know, and, and may hopefully not meteoric falls. But I just, you know, I, I really thank all of you guys for coming to listen to us. And I hope that we've given you some degree of ideas of, of things to um, think about and to pursue. And everybody's path is going to be different, but I hope that we at least kind of reflect the, that it is possible um, and that um, you can do this because obviously we're, we're doing it and we continue to, and um, there is a way to access, to be able to answer these questions, ask these questions and answer them. Um, I still go to people, my colleagues to ask questions. Um, you know, I think the day that we figure this out is probably the next day I'll fall over, you know? So um, just know that the fact that you're here today and you spent this much time with us, um, you know, shows that um, you guys are committed and um, just keep, you know, keep doing, doing, doing this and you will get there. Uh, should we go to, uh, anyone want to offer, anyone want to run away and go? Uh, <laughs> uh, should we, Daisha, do you want to give us some final words? Um. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm really, really happy and honored to be on this panel with so many amazing people. I think that it's, you know, we're in a really shitty time and on so many levels, but that shitty time has allowed us this moment. So I have to at least be thankful for that and um, thankful that so many, so many of you were able to join and stay for this long. Um, and I would just say, yeah, be be stubborn in your pursuit of this because it isn't always going to be easy. And it's like someone said, it's very difficult. It's, you know, if you have things uh, about yourself, like Kelly said earlier, if you have things about yourself that you know might be a hindrance to pushing forward in this in this career, you know, figure a way, figure a way around them. Um, learn yourself, learn more about yourself and and continue to continue to work, continue to practice and, and hone this craft because it'll only be helpful. If you have time right now because you're unemployed and you have nothing to do, like use this moment as much as you can, you know, to uh, get better, to, to learn. Um, being here is an important part of that. So I appreciate uh, all of you for coming, uh, that's it. Um, thank you so much, Daisha. Uh, Kelly, last things from Kelly. Um, I appreciate you guys asking me to be a part of this. I was really looking to hear of what a lot of you guys um, were talking about. The whole racial aspect to me is just, it's, I'm, I'm so mind boggled and disappointed, especially in in all of the, you know, supremacy bullshit, but I'm so glad to see, you know, this many black people that are interested in trying to get, you know, into our jobs, which is great. Um, and I wish I had better advice to offer as far as how to do it. Um, but I think honestly, that thing that I said about finding writers and talking to writers, that like just came to me when I was listening to Terry. And I think that that is actually a key 
I got a friend on here that texted me and she goes, oh my God, that is like great news. You know, that is really brilliant. And I was like, yeah, I just thought of it, but I really think that it is valid at this point. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate, again, Simon, I appreciate um, you asking me to do this. Um, I, I would love to talk to you at some point about your work on Chernobyl. I've worked with Johan before. And I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. Paul, I, you know, would really love to have a chat with you. Um, I'm working on some Marvel stuff right now. You'd be really, really good. Uh, uh, you know, just, I, I would love to hear your experience. Brayden, all you guys, Daisha, that Insecure that you did a couple of weeks ago, awesome. Kristen, it was so good to see you again. Um, and Terry, honestly, I have never gotten a chance to, you know, sit down and chat with you you but i hope to have the chance and i hope that i i didn't need to put you on the spot i hope that you didn't interpret it that way um and again all of you guys um good luck um i know it's very difficult out there especially now and it's kind of hard to figure out how to start up but i think that um i mean honestly if i wasn't working right now i think that some of the advice that you know people have given about start to hone your skills. I'm looking at some of these questions going, man, I, I guess it would be a good time to learn After Effects right now, <laughs> you know? Um, and I hate to sound, you know, be so um, uh, sketchy, but um, this is what's going on right below me. <laughs> I have to walk this dog. Um, this is my dog, Rex. I just got him, he's a, He's a COVID uh, acquirement, and he's been outside for three hours while I've been on this, so I need to go walk in. Um, but thank you, everyone, and, uh, you know, have a nice evening. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kelly. Nice you later. Amazing. Um, Kristen? Uh, I guess I would just close with saying um, embrace the fear, um, embrace the anxiety. Um, because it never goes, it never stops with any job that you take. And um, yeah, what Deja said, like know yourself and every use every day to know yourself even more, whether that be what your ultimate goals are, what your interests are, what you hope to accomplish, like with your career, any technical skills you want to learn. Um, those things are huge. And I'm also extremely grateful to be here. This is my first time ever doing a panel and uh, yeah. This is awesome. I literally like Terry knows I say this to her every time, but I sent her when I first moved to LA, like I sent her agent like letters that never got to her until later. But like this is a huge honor for me. Paul, Daisha, Braden, everybody, Kelly. I mean, I I, st I stopped and talked to Kelly like forever at that prime cuts and I knew that you wouldn't remember me. So um this is a huge, huge honor. Thank you guys so much. Oh, thank you, Kristen. Um, Paul? Um, I'll just close with uh, stay strong. Like, it, it is tough getting in. It's tough, you know, getting the next job. Um, and, and you're going to hit some good highs, and you're going to hit some, some tough lows. Uh, and you got to, you know, be able to weather that. And you'll have things that uh, kind of knock you back. Like, um, I can see myself extremely confident. Um, at, at what I do, and I had that confidence kind of rocks, uh, rocks to the point that, you know, I actually did leave the industry and, and, in LA for a few months. Like, I, I was like, I, I can't do this. And, you know, I had to check myself. I was like, oh, I've been, I've been succeeding. I've been, I've been doing all right. And it's like, I know what I know. Um, and I just let a mountain of things, you know, people will try to knock you down while you're, you're coming up in this. Um, and I was like, nah, <laughs> not having that. So I just close with that. Be prepared for, you know, don't get high on the highs. Don't get low on the lows. Be prepared for them. Paul, thank you, mate. You're amazing. Um, uh, I want to go to Braden, but um, like before I do, uh, I, I do want to say that like this all started from a conversation that me and Braden had. And I think after that Twitter storm, you know, there was just a lot of hate and negativity and, and, and sadness that came from that. And part of what 
I wanted to do, we wanted to do tonight with this was to have something really positive, you know, a, a really positive community event where everyone can feel, you know, uh, like excited about hopefully joining our industry. Or as, as Kelly said, like a lot of you are in our industry and, you know, pursuing your careers and, and becoming, you know, everything that you want to, you want to be in editing. So um, hopefully that's, that's what we've done. Um, Braden, like, Thank you, mate. Um, what 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 are your final final words? Uh, yeah, I I think I, I mean I would really echo everything everybody already said. Uh, it's all really great. Uh, you know, I think the the last message I would just hammer home that I've been trying to hammer this entire time is just how important it is to network and to network aggressively and like Kelly said to uh, and like Terry said to be your own advocate. Um, and like Daisha said, to, to do it stubbornly and to really campaign for yourself, but also uh, to be patient because we've all been doing this, you know, for years and it, it didn't come overnight. It didn't come from, you know, one single movement and it came from a lot of hard work and learning and, uh, you know, doing all the things that we got to do that uh, I'm sure a lot of you know that you need to do. Um, so, you know, be strong in your efforts, get in the room whenever you can, because you're not always going to be afforded the opportunity, but just get yourself in the room and be patient, but also, you know, push. And um, yeah, I just want to thank this entire panel. You guys are all amazing. Um, I want to thank everybody that came and, and stayed this long, even the, even the people who couldn't stay for three hours. That's pretty crazy. Um, and Simon, you know, thank you for being the advocate that you are and, uh, and setting all this up. And uh, this has been really fantastic. And I hope we can continue the conversation going forward. And I think we're gonna try to figure out how to get this recording to everybody. And, uh, you know, some people suggested maybe a Facebook group or something. So I think, you know, we're gonna talk further about how to make this uh, an opportunity to continue the conversation. So really, thank you, everybody. And oh, let me let me also say thank you to my wife Nicole for yeah. uh, being absolutely amazing. You better. Uh, I wanted to get that in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much for making it so apparent because I found out about it on Twitter just because of your screenshots. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Thank you. The other thing thank that Brady said. Look, this overnight success was 20 years in the making. <laughs> it was a long night. <laughs> all right. Okay. That sounds good. Okay, thank you, everybody. And thank let's you. all be in touch. Take good care. Time. Thank good you. Time, please, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.